Section 25 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid. The Perfect World by Ellis Grimsour. Section 25. Hatred on Kimar. Marlinoc, the Jacax Majordomo, called on Sir John and Alan a few days after they had witnessed the sacrament of Schlerik Etata. Will you be ready, he asked them, when the Kaimo is at the full, to start your journey to Humori to render homage to the Rorka? Are we all to go? asked Alan. But one of you need go, he answered. The Rorka will visit Miniviar later, and then the other strangers may make their bows. I am glad of that, said Sir John, for I should like to stay here in quietness and retirement for a little while. I am beginning to feel the burden of my age, and am worn out with the strain of the last few years. I will go to Hermori, announced Alan. I can start at whatever time the Jaycock thinks best. He has prepared incense and jewels for you to take as gifts from the absent ones, said Marlinoc. If you will now see Wazikeshta, all your arrangements can be made. I'll go now, said Alan. Alan was going down a pretty lane toward where the air birds were housed when he suddenly became aware of footsteps behind him. He turned. Immediately the footsteps ceased, and he could see no one. Thinking he must be mistaken and fearing nothing from the Kimarnians, he went on his way blithely. The air was deliciously warm, and the fresh breeze, balmy with the scent of flowers, tempered it. Still the footsteps followed with monotonous regularity. As he hastened, so they became quicker. As his died down, so they ceased altogether. Yet he had no sense of fear, no feeling of impending evil. The thought of peril on Kimar was impossible to imagine. The Kimarnians were of a breed as different from the earth to which he belonged as he was from heaven. He passed delightful homely fields, gleaming with buttercups and daisies. Friendly cows chewed the cud in sleepy enjoyment. They did not rise as he drew near, but only raised their sleepy heads and looked at him out of their liquid eyes with interest and friendliness. A pig grunted in a corner as she suckled her squealing young, a donkey brayed, a couple of goats were nibbling the grass while their kids frolicked near them. He saw strange animals, too. There was the gorwa of the deer family, a beautiful creature, the color of a Scottish stag, and its counterpart in miniature, but with none of its brother's timidity. All the animals on Kimar were of a smaller build than those he had been accustomed to. The cows were even smaller than the little fawn jerseys so valued in England. He had seen terriers and bulldogs, Dalmatians and spaniels in this strange world, and the bigger breeds were all represented on a smaller scale. The Jacak had a dog, a Borzy, Alan would have called it, yet perhaps it was no bigger than a small Irish terrier. But strangely enough, its beauty was not diminished by its minuteness. So Alan went on. The way was strange to him, but he was enjoying the calmness of the scene, and he knew his excellent bump of locality would sooner or later lead him to Waikeshka. Again the footsteps beat time with his own, and anxious for companionship, he stepped into the shadow of a tree, and hoped to waylay a shy but friendly stranger. A second passed. The footsteps had ceased, then came a rustling, and the head of Colmervan the student appeared over a honeysuckle bush. Silently he came forward, alert and watchful until he was on a level with Alan. Hello, said Alan amiably. Where are you going, Colmervan? The effect was magical. Colmervan jumped as though he had been struck, and his face whitened. He remained silent. I'm going to see Waji Kesta, I went on Alan. Are you coming my way? Colmervan did not reply, but a baleful light gleamed in his eyes and his mouth twitched. "'What's the matter?' asked Alan curiously. Suddenly Colmervan spoke, and there was a wealth of passion in his tones. "'Why did you come here, you strangers? I was happy until you came. I was contented. You have made me want, want the unknown. You have stirred my heart and filled it with longings that I cannot yet fathom. Why have you come to stir up misery among a happy and contented race?' "'I don't know what you mean,' said Alan. I have done nothing. You've done everything. You dared to raise your eyes to the level of Clory, our Ipso Rorca. You put thoughts about her into my head. Oh, as Alan would have broken in, I read your thoughts. It was easy, my friend. 
You dared to think of her as a woman, even your woman. It was an impertinence, I tell you. I love Clory with my whole soul, and before Mitzer the Mighty, I'll carry her away into some far-off land before she can look with a favorable eye on a man, not only of another world, but a man of coarser nature than our own. Comervan was breathless when he finished, for his words had come up thick and fast, tumbling over themselves in his great excitement. Alan was speechless and looked as he felt, absolutely uncomfortable and ill at ease. Why, your very pose proves guilt, continued Colmervan. Why should I not love Clory? demanded Alan. Why should my love for her cause strife between us? Because, my stranger, I am a prince of the Rorka's house. I am not only Colmervan the student, but Tazak of the house of Pluthos. Why else would Clory have honored my party? Why else come to the dance of a student? There are but four Kimarnians that Clory can marry, and I rank second. Alan wondered at the time why the princess should come in so natural a manner to the student's reception. He wondered at the time at her familiarity with Colmervan. She had patted his hand, smiled into his eyes, and had honored him more than once with a dance. But Alan, too, was in love idiotically, insanely in love with a woman who had not even troubled to raise her eyes to his at his presentation. His pulses throbbed at the remembrance of the touch of her fingertips as he raised them to his lips. He loved her, and in that moment was born a desire to overcome all obstacles, and princess or no princess, to win her. But he knew, too, that in this pleasant land of Kimar, an enmity had come upon him, and wondered whether the curse of death had brought it. He wondered whether the dead and decomposed body of their faithful Murdoch had indeed brought sorrow to this fair land. "'I've spoken to your Ipsa Rorka only once,' said he, "'the night of your party. She has called on my uncle and Mavis. Mavis has been out driving with her several times. But I, unfortunately, have missed her each time. Surely you are not jealous because I—' "'Because you love her?' "'I am,' said Colmervan thickly, "'and I say this.' If you so much as dare to raise your eyes to her, if you dare to address her, I'll make you suffer for it. I, even though I also suffer eternally for it. And with that, he turned on his heel and walked quickly away. Alan was very perturbed about this meeting and felt inclined to tell the story of it to Wazi Keshta. Yet the sacred feeling he had for Clory was not to be spoken of or bandied about from man to man. No, he would keep it to himself and trusted time and common sense to cure Comervan of his strange hatred. He walked quickly on, and already could see the airbirds in the distance circling above their houses. The little lane turned quickly at right angles. There was a steep descent, and hedges rose at either side to a height of six or seven feet, while the overhanging branches of the trees met in the middle and formed a leafy arch. The grassy banks were carpeted with flowers, and the scent hung sweet on the air. Again the narrow path turned sharply to the right, and before Alan realized it, there almost at his feet, stretched across almost the full width of the path, lay a lion, full-grown, with his shaggy mane stirring in the breeze. Alan stopped suddenly, and his heart beat quickly. The lion's eyes were closed. He was sleeping. The Englishman was almost afraid to move, lest the savage beast should spring upon him and devour him. He looked round to the right. The bough of a tree hung low over the path. He leapt up the bank, and with one mighty spring caught hold of it, and swarmed up to a topmost branch. He was safe, but the sudden sound had startled the lion, who rose up and with a low growl prowled backward and forward beneath the tree. It was an uncomfortable position to be in. The tree bough was very thin, and bent and twisted and crackled ominously. Still the king of beasts remained sentinel underneath. Alan felt the perspiration on his face as the limb shivered and bent, yet there was no other to which he could move. Still the animal remained near, his quickened senses no doubt wondering at the noise he heard and waiting to see what had caused it. The minutes dragged by. The branch was weakening perceptibly. He could already see the white of the inside where the branch was gradually tearing away from the parent trunk. There was no one in sight, and still the lion walked restlessly to and fro. The chimo was sinking rapidly. It was already low down on the horizon, and Alan knew he had been about two English hours in his perilous position. He saw a branch above his head, and he wormed his way along to see if he could in any way reach it. 
Carefully he went, slowly. Suddenly, with a scream and a crash, the branch gave way, and Alan felt himself being hurled to the ground. The distance was not great, and he landed in the center of some sweet-smelling soft bushes. He was dazed and wondered when the lion would pounce. He knew he was powerless to help himself. He heard the pad-pad of its feet. He could hear the sharp intake of its breath. Then the thing was upon him. He shut his eyes and waited. Nothing happened but the snuffling of the wild beast and a gentle nosing as it examined the stranger. Alan opened his eyes. The animal was sitting on its haunches surveying him, and he felt there was amusement in the beast's eyes as it watched him. He moved slightly. Still the beast watched motionless. He raised himself up from the encircling bushes and clambered down. He knew he would have to face the inevitable. Suddenly a voice hailed him, and he saw Wazikeshta coming round the bend in the lane. Stand back, he cried. There's a lion here. He may spring. But the Waz came on fearlessly. Alan was petrified. His tongue was parched. No sound came from his lips. He watched the Waz in frozen horror. The Kimarnian was smiling. Where have you been, my friend? You were late, very late. I thought you had missed your way, so I came to seek you. He was now within three feet of the lion. What is the matter? Why are you so grave? Has aught affrighted you? Alan pointed to the tawny beast. His hand was shaking. Surely the farce must end soon. The lion spring and tragedy culminate the play. Why mock were, said the Waz affectionately. What are you doing here? You seldom visit us, you know. The lion moved toward him and rubbed his great head against the Kimarnian's leg, while Waikeshta talked to him and petted him. He's tamed them? gasped Alan with a rush of relief. You know him? No, my friend. I've never seen this Makor before. They generally stay in rocky places. But he is so friendly. All beasts are friendly here, my Alan. What, would Makur have hurt you on your earth? And Alan laughingly told of his fright at the lion. He had learnt one more truth about Kimar. There were no savage animals upon it. Of a truth, it was a perfect land. Wazikeshta was highly amused at his friend's story, and together they went toward the airbirds. The Kamarnian airships were indeed wonderful creations. White and gold, they were shaped like swans, with graceful wings outspread, gleaming in the light. They were made of a mixture of wood and metal, and contained accommodation for perhaps forty passengers, as well as the Waz in command, and a staff of ten. Although not as big as the ill-fated Argenta, the Kimarnian airship was possessed of a speed nearly thrice as great. This is Clory, said Waikeshka, and our fastest bird. The Jekak has given orders that you are to choose your own vessel, so perhaps you would like to see over some others? No, said Alan, looking at the blue hangings and seeing in them the reflection of his love's eyes. No, this one will do beautifully. And the Waz was impressed by the easy way in which his friend was pleased. He little realized that it was the name of the vessel, the quarry, that attracted him. And in the strangeness of it, Alan tried to read his fate. We'll go for a short cruise, said the Waz, and go back to the landing stage, Miniavar. There was not a cloud in the sky, and the warmth from the sun's rays was pleasant. I can't understand how you benefit so considerably from the sun, your Kaimo, said Alan. Let me see. You must be at least five times further away from the sun than we were on our earth. Yet instead of your light and heat being reduced to about one twenty-fifth of our supply, you appear to benefit to exactly the same degree. Ah, my friend, that is easy to explain. Dark clouds hover outside our globe. Yes, bands of vapor, corrected Alan. Well, vapor. These bands completely encircle our world. They are saturated with a composition of gas, sulfuric ether, I think you would call it. Well, this gas acts as a trap to the sun's rays. It admits the solar rays to our planet but prevents their withdrawal. Therefore, it permits the heat to enter but prevents its escape. Well, consequently, we get the maximum of light and an equable temperature. Do you then have no seasons here? Seasons? Yes, spring or winter. Oh yes, it is cold at the poles, very cold. But as we get nearer to the equator, it becomes warmer and hardly varies. You see, my Alan, our world differs from yours. 
the axis of rotation is almost perpendicular to our orbit. Consequently, we are not subject to seasons as you were in Quilthus. I didn't know that before. We, too, are more flattened at each end. Indeed, there are many differences between our world that is and yours that was. Do you ever have rain here? Yes, my Alan. How else would plants live and crops thrive? But again, we do not suffer from excesses. But don't you have hurricanes that last from six to seven weeks? Surely those are excesses. Hurricanes. I do not know the word. Hurricanes, winds, tornadoes. Why, they affect only the polar regions and nothing lives there. Well, laughed Alan, I think your world is a great improvement on ours. The scenery they passed on this pleasure trip was very varied, but very similar to the world he knew at its best. Here he could imagine he was in the highlands of Scotland with its crags and hills and torrents. There in southern France, with its vineyards sloping to the river's edge, again the warmth of coloring suggested the tropics, and the next moment they were flying over great inland arms of a sea that were reminiscent of the fjords of Norway. They descended at last and went to the jaycock to bid him farewell. There a surprise awaited Alan. My son, said the jaycock, our Ipso Rorca has decided to travel in the glory to Humori. She desires to reach her father's side without any more delay. Taza Komervan has obtained permission from his kinswoman to attend her on the journey. But you need have no fear, my Alan. I doubt whether you will even see the princess. She will keep within the precincts of her apartments and will be attended exclusively by her maid. Alan felt distressed. Should he tell the jaycock of his encounter with Komervan? Had he obeyed his first impulse and confided in the kindly old man, he would have saved both himself and Clory from much suffering. As it was, well, who can tell which is always the right course to take? Errors are made and paid for in suffering, even in a perfect world. Is it far, my jaycock, to Humori? Forty kaimos will take you there. Forty kaimos, about twenty of our earth days. It is quite a long way, then. Ah, my friend, you have no idea of the size of our planet. And yet you are all one nation, with the same customs in religion and speech. It is hard to comprehend, my jaycock, for at home on our little islands we were composed of four distinct races. The Ipso Rorca will board the glory immediately, said the jaycock. Now Mitzer be with you. Farewell. There was no sign of the princess when Alan boarded the ship. Neither was Colmervan to be seen, but he was surprised to find Waco lounging on the deck. He gave Alan a cursory nod of recognition as he passed, but did not rise or offer any greeting. "'Don't you know Waco?' asked Waikeshka in some surprise. "'Why, of course. I met him at Colmervan's party. "'Then why does he not rise and greet you according to Kimarnian custom? "'You have broken bread with him. "'Please, Waikeshka, don't say any more. "'I—' I think I understand, and perhaps it's my fault. Let it pass. As you will, my Alan. The glory rose, soared gracefully over the marble buildings of Miniavar, then, tilting her nose, climbed swiftly. The princess remained in her cabin, her doors were closed, and the balconies round her apartment shuttered. Ought I to pay my respects to the Ipsororka? asked Alan. Wazikeshta looked at him in horror. Nay, my friend! It is not seemly to address our Ipso Rorca unless she summons you first. She has given strict orders that she is not to be disturbed. So, Colmervan had begun his work of revenge. Darkness fell, and Alan retired to his little cabin. There were few on board, ten souls in all, and the whole place was wrapped in stillness. All the same, he felt very restless. The four moons of Jupiter were shining brightly. They were now passing over a sea, and the moonbeams were playing on the rippling waters. He rose, dressed himself, and was about to leave his cabin when he heard a faint movement outside. His senses were quickened. He felt for the first time since his entrance into this new world a feeling of impending danger. In a second, his mind was made up. Quickly, he placed a cushion on his couch and covered it over with rugs. In the semi-darkness, it almost showed the curves of a living body. The door latch rattled softly, and Alan slipped behind the folds of a heavy silken curtain. Softly the door opened, until it was just wide enough to permit the passage of a man's body. Alan peered through the curtain opening and saw that it was Colmervan who had entered. 
The Kimarnian stepped over to the couch and touched the coverlet. He's asleep, he whispered in his own language, and Waco entered softly. Have you the spray? Yes, Michael Mervan, but is it necessary? I'm afraid... Fool, hissed Colmervan. The spray. Waco handed him a long piece of tubing, the end of which was fastened to a small bulb. Colmervan laid the nozzle end on the bed. There was a slight hissing sound, and the room became sweet with a subtle scent. Quick, whispered Colmervan to his accomplice. Hasten, lest the fumes overpower us. And the two hurriedly left the chamber, closing the door tightly behind them. The air was already heavy and Alan felt a drowsiness coming over him. With a mighty effort, he opened the window and leant out. It was a battle royal between the fumes and the fresh air. Alan felt his head reel and his senses swim, but the pure night air conquered, and the little cabin was soon free of its poison. Silently, Alan sat until the dawn broke, thinking over the strange problem that had presented itself to him. He had made an enemy, unwittingly, it is true, but an enemy who would stop at nothing in order to further his ends. He wondered what effect the powerful fumes would have had upon him. In a land where there was no death, could life be taken? What would have happened to him had he inhaled them? He was determined to ask Wajikesta at the first opportunity. Suddenly, from without, a cheery voice hailed him. It was the Waz. "'How did you sleep, my friend?' and he entered the cabin. "'Very well, indeed.' said Alan, glibly lying. I slept badly, my Alan. I had evil dreams of you. I saw you lying. Sirkwer, oh! What is Sirkwer? It is the worst thing that could befall us on Kimar, my friend. Seldom it happens, but once in a lifetime. The body stiffens. Sleep comes from which one never awakens. Life is, to all intents and purposes, extinct. Yet the body does not melt into nothingness, as at the sacrament of Shalarika Tata, it remains on earth, cut off from the living, cut off from those already in glory, useless, desolate, alone. What causes it? asked Alan eagerly. Sometimes a blow or a fall, or it can be produced artificially by inhaling morca, a gas used in the weaving of our silks. The workers wear shields over their mouths when using it, and are very careful. Never have I known such an accident to occur, but it could. It was thus I dreamt of you, my Alan. Alan smiled. He had come across as strange proofs of telepathy as in the old world between kindred spirits. Whatever happened, he knew Wazikeshta was his friend. Perhaps I am in danger, my friend, said he. If so, can I count on you? My Alan, I would suffer even Sirkwar for you, he answered fervently and Alan knew he spoke truly. End of section 25section 26 of The Perfect World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid the Perfect World by Ella Scrimsour, Section 26, The Unforgivable Kiss The day passed slowly. Still the princess remained in her cabin. Alan passed Waco with his usual cheery smile, and the guilty student trembled and turned white at sight of the healthy man, who he thought had been doomed to surcor. Colmervan remained in his cabin near the princess and had his meal served him there. Wazikeska realized that something was wrong, but as Alan did not confide in him, he made no effort to find out the cause of his friend's restlessness. "'My waz,' said Alan suddenly, "'is it possible for me to see the Ipsa Rorca? "'I wish to speak to her.' "'Not unless she sends for you, my friend. "'It is impossible else.' "'It is a matter of grave import,' said Alan earnestly. "'To me, to her... "'Nothing can alter custom, my friend. "'If she sends for you, well...' otherwise, and he shrugged his shoulders expressively. Alan, however, was determined to speak with Chlory by foul means or fair. Her cabin was situated in the front of the ship, and round it was a tiny balcony railed in just above the level of the deck. He paced round this portion of the ship the whole day, resting only at mealtimes from his self-imposed watch. Never once did the princess appear. The Kaima was setting, 
The sky was bright with sunset colors. The sea was unruffled and calm. A fish leapt out of the water, leaving rings of glistening fluid, roseate in the glow. Alan sat, out of sight, still watching the cabin door. Suddenly it opened, and Morar, the princess's personal attendant, appeared. She looked around hastily. All is quiet, my princess, she cried. No one is in sight. The sinful stranger is in his cabin, no doubt plotting ill against you and yours. Clory came through the doorway. Her hair was gleaming, and her flowing draperies of blue showed up the fairness of her skin. I am stifled, Morar. Tis ill to spend so many hours without a breath of air. Watch you the other side, and should you see the evil one appear, appraise me, and I will again take shelter within. With a low bow, Morar vanished, closing the cabin door behind her. The princess paced up and down the tiny balcony, singing a Kimarnian lullaby. Still, Alan remained silent and watchful, hidden from sight beneath the covering rail. Morar returned. There is no sign of Alan the evil one, said she, but Tazak Kolnavan begs an audience. Bid him come hither, said the princess with a sigh. Tell him I am weary and must beg of him to be quick about his business. She seated herself on a swinging lounge just above Alan, who could almost feel the sweetness of her presence, the fragrance of her breath. "'Sweet cousin,' said Colmervan, entering. "'Nay, Colmervan, say what you have to say quickly. "'My head is tired, my eyes weary. "'You have not been out today, my glory? "'Not until this evening. "'I have carefully obeyed your instructions. "'Were my father here, I should not care. "'But I dare not run any risks in his absence. "'How is Waco? "'Still very weak, my princess. "'This evil one, this Alan has contrived his evil work well. When I discovered Waco, a bandage was drawn tightly round his mouth, his nostrils were plugged with wool, and had I not entered when I did, Sirkor would have set in, and Waco would no more have laughed and played. Oh, it's terrible, breathed the princess. Why has sin thus entered our beautiful land? I have heard of treasons and plots and miseries, but so far we have escaped. What is this stranger's object, my Colmervan? I know not all his treachery, my Clory, but why bring sorrow on Waco's family and upon you, his friend? I do not understand, but his intentions are evil throughout. I heard him tell his kinsman Desmond that even the person of Clory herself was not sacred to him, provided he worked his will. That is enough, Colmervan, she interrupted haughtily. I will keep my cabin as you advise. Had I known in time, I would not have traveled home in his company. The Rorka, my father, will deal with this stranger, and the Hall of Sorrows will hold him safely until he has been purged clean. Now good night. Clory, said Colmervan passionately, I dare say much to you tonight. Will you not offer me the flower of love? I dare not ask you to wed me. You are ipso Rorka. Tis for you to choose. But no, I love you. Love you with all my soul. Will you not honor me by choosing me for your mate? Colmervan, said the princess gently, why make me sad by all this useless talk? It can never be. I can place my hand in only one man's, him I love. Him, alas, I have not yet met, but I do not love you, my Colmervan. I never shall. Think, <laughs> we played together in her Murray as babies, built palaces of sand by the sea, picked flowers, and fondled our pets. We grew as brother and sister until you went to study with the Joe, and I had to learn the lesson of royalty. No, my kinsman, I love you, tis true, but not as a maid should love the man she mates, not as wife or husband, lover for lover. Let this be the last time you speak of such things, my Colmervan. I will forget, and... But I want you, you, you! And Colmervan strode close to her and placed his arms about her. Let me go, breathed the girl, but his lips were seeking hers. No, 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 she cried. Not my lips. Colmervan, be merciful. My lips are sacred until I wed. Spare my lips. But Colmervan's reason had gone. My beautiful one, he murmured, and ran his fingers through her glorious mantle of hair. He held her head between his hands and drank in the glory of her face. Her eyes were open wide in terror, her lips tightly compressed, her power of movement gone. 
Nearer, nearer he drew. His breath came in hot gusts upon her cheek. Her eyelids quivered under his scorching kisses. Her cheeks reddened as his lips touched them. With one mighty effort, she tried to release herself. In the name of Mitzer the Great, leave my lips, she cried. But the madness of passion was upon him. He reveled in his power, laughed at her struggles, mocked at her impotence. Roughly, he clasped her still closer to him, but the princess was inert in his arms. The strain was too much for her, and blissful unconsciousness had come to soothe her. There was the slightest of sounds. Alan, the athletic still, vaulted over the rail, and swinging Colmer Van by the scruff of his neck, threw him onto the ground. Tenderly, he lifted the princess in his arms. She was as light as a feather, and went into her cabin. Morar, he called. Morar! The serving maid appeared, trembling as she saw her beloved mistress in the arms of the evil one. Your mistress has had a fright, said Alan thickly. Show me her couch. Without a word, the little maid led the way into the tiny sleeping apartment, and tenderly he laid his burden on the silken coverings of blue. Look after her, said he. She has fainted. With arms folded across his chest and his breath coming in spasmodic jerks, he waited outside the door. Presently, Morar appeared. The Ipsa Rorca has recovered, she said, and has now fallen asleep. What shall I do? Allow no one to enter her apartments at all. I will send a letter to her in the morning. Can I depend on your giving it to her? Yes, I can see that you are not evil, said the little maid. Some mistake has been made. You are her friend. I am her friend, said Alan grimly. Remember, Morar, no one is to enter these apartments without the Ipsa Rorca's permission. You understand? And he strode out onto the balcony. Colmervan was gone, and he vaulted lightly over the balcony rail and went straight to his cabin. As he opened the door, he recognized the sweet, sickly odor that he had smelt once before. So, he must be on his guard. Colmervan and Waco would stop at nothing. A madness had indeed come over them, a madness of the earth. Holding his breath, he went swiftly across the room and opened the windows, then, shutting the door behind him, went into the big saloon. Wazikeshka smiled as he entered. Where have you been, my friend? I looked for you everywhere. Resting, said Alan grimly. That night he never went to bed, but waited grimly for what might happen. He was left in peace, however, and toward dawn slept fitfully. When he woke, he wrote this letter to Clory. Clory, the Ipsa Rorca. I beg of you, see me, just once before we alight in Hurmori. I overheard the conversation of Colmervan, and implore you to see me, if only to clear myself of the imputations your kinsman has made against me. In any case, believe that I am your devoted servant always. Command me. I will obey. Alan. He took the letter to Morar himself. I will wait while the Ipsa Rorca reads it, said he. In a moment she had returned. She will answer you later. There were only four more nights to be spent on board the Clory, but much might happen in that time. There was no sign of the enemy. All Alan could do was wait patiently for their next move. That night, again, he had no sleep. Soon after he retired, the same sickly odor permeated the cabin. Again he leant out of the window until the fumes had passed. This time they were stronger and took a longer time to dispel. He smiled. <laughs> it was to be a duel to the end, and he needed all his wits about him. Certainly, Kimarnians, possessed of the madness, were more formidable, more crafty, more callous enemies than men belonging to Terra. Another night passed. No communication had come from Clory. Alan, weary of his vigil, tried to keep awake, but drowsiness overcame him, and his last conscious effort was to drag himself to the window and rest with his head breathing in the pure air. Again the sweet fumes entered the room, but Alan had safeguarded himself. The next night passed without the enemy showing their hand. They doubtless thought him proof against Sircor, and would take other methods to rid themselves of his presence. Suddenly, in the darkness of the night, a noise interrupted his musings. There was a jerk, a crash, and the vessel shivered. Alan flew out of his cabin and met Wazi Keshka. "'What is it?' he cried." Nothing to be alarmed about, my friend. 
Something has happened to the engine. I have not discovered what, yet. We shall be forced to make a descent. Luckily, there is an island near. We will anchor there and put the matter right. We shall be delayed only a very short time, I think. The machine descended in jerks and jumps with many creakings and groanings, but reached the ground in safety. I will seek Marar and tell her to acquaint the Ipsororca with this news, said the Waz. The whole day passed, and the Waikeshka called Alan in dismay. I cannot understand it, said he. There's a screw missing here, and that waste pipe has been filled with refuse. It means taking the whole of the mechanism to pieces in two days' delay at least. But Alan guessed who had planned this sinister work, and that night he kept vigil, not in his own room, but outside the princess's. Wajikeska was frankly puzzled. Yesterday I fixed up the screw for the outer valve, said he, yet today it has gone again. Surely I couldn't have dreamt it, yet it could not go without hands. Perhaps someone has moved it, purposely, for spite, suggested Alan. Wajikeska laughed. Not in Kimar. Besides, what for? Who could do such a foolish thing? True, the faith of a Kimarnian was wonderful. Alan longed to confide in him, yet dared not. For the second time, he made a mistake. Alan saw Morar and asked her if the princess's apartments were quite safe from intruders. Quite, said she. There's only a very small window, and the doors have heavy bars. She always keeps them locked? Always. That night, Alan remained in his own cabin, and worn out with continual watching, fell asleep at his open window. He had a dream so vivid that he thought it was real, and awoke with a start. Glory, the lady of his heart, had appeared to him, arms outstretched, eyes swimming with tears. My lord, she whispered, the cave of whispering madness, the cave... Her voice trailed away, something dark came before his eyes, there was the sound of a scuffle, a small cry... He felt a stabbing pain, and he awoke. It was broad daylight, and his door was flung open wide, and Wajikeska, usually so placid and calm, was staring at him and calling him in excited distress. My Alan, awake! I beg of you. What is it? The Ipsororca is gone. Gone? Gone. She has disappeared. Are you sure? Morar, her maid, left her as usual last night. This morning she knocked as usual for the princess to open the door, which, by the way, she always keeps barred, but she could get no answer. Thinking her mistress had overslept, she went round to look in at the window. The bed was empty. Clory was not there. Where's Colmervan? asked Alan thickly. Colmervan? Yes. Is he on the boat? I do not know. Go and see at once, and I'll go to Morar. The Ipso Rorca's little maid was crying bitterly. Without any ceremony, Alan forced the door. The bed was rumpled and rough, the silken coverlets twisted and torn. Glory had not gone without a struggle. Wazi Keshka came to Alan, with consternation written all over his face. Three are missing altogether, said he. Can some evil spirit have taken them? Colmervan and Waco are nowhere to be found. I thought as much, said Alan savagely. He glanced rapidly round the room. A pile of papers lay on a desk. He smoothed them out. There, in a little blue envelope addressed to himself, was a letter from his dear one. He opened it quickly. My lord, it ran. Since you saved me from my kinsman, Colmervan, my cousin, has once more forced himself into my presence. He is possessed of a madness. I beg of you, save me from him. I have looked at you often, and I know now I was deceived by him when he whispered tales of your evil doing. I trust you implicitly. I do as you bid me. I command your help. Glory. Then underneath was written. He has spoken to me again through my window. He threatens me with dishonor, disgrace. He talks of the cave of whispering madness. Come to me on receipt of this. The cur, muttered Alan. He turned to Wakashka. Where is the cave of whispering madness? I have never heard of it, my Alan. Listen, I am going to find Clory. Wait for me here with the air bird. Should I fail to come by the time the Kaimo has sunk ten times, go at once to the Rorca and ask him to send his aid here. Where, then, is Clory? I don't know, but I'm going to do my best to find out. 
This island isn't very big, ten square miles at most, and I intend to search every bit of it if necessary to find her. What about Colmer Van and Waco? Should you see them, put them under restraint. Bar their windows and prevent their escape. They are both possessed of the madness. But there, I doubt if you'll see them. Where Clory is, there shall I also find Colmer Van and Waco. Can I come too? No, my friend. You stay here and watch in case Clory comes. I go now. I shall take no provision with me. Fruit will be my meat, and the sap of the water tree my drink. Farewell. And Alan leapt over the bulwarks and disappeared from sight in the thick brush and undergrowth of the island. End of section 26「Section 27 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Perfect World by Ella Scrimsour. Section 27. Alan, the Knight Errant. As Alan leapt over the bulwarks, his quick eye caught sight of footmarks two going one way and two the other, with perhaps five feet between them. So, said he grimly to himself, they were carrying her between them, poor little Clory. The tracks were easy to follow. They led down to the sea and along the seashore. Steadily they went on, and Alan followed dauntlessly. There was no attempt made to cover their traces. On they went, carrying their burden between them. They had about ten hours' start, and although night was falling, Alan continued at his self-imposed task. Darker and darker it grew, until at length it was impossible to see the footmarks, so he sat down hopelessly to wait for dawn. The night was chilly and the rain poured down, so Alan was soaked to the skin and shivered violently as the grey dawn rose. The rain had almost obliterated the marks, but they showed up faintly here and there on the wet sand. He had no time to look at the scenery through which he was passing. His one thought was Clory, not the princess, but Clory the woman, Clory his love. On, on, he went all day, and still the footprints showed here and there. Night came, and again he was forced to rest and wait for the light. He was colder than ever, he shivered violently, and longed for the warmth of the sun. That night he never slept at all, and he rose in the early morning light, stiff and tired. His head felt light, his limbs ached, and the one thing he could think of coherently was Clory. Suddenly, all traces of the marks vanished. He hunted high and low, but all to no purpose. They ended as abruptly as if the pursued had been snatched up into the heavens. Two nights and two days he wandered to and fro. He was chilled to the bone and was in a high fever. At last he had to give in and lay under the shelter of a tree. The warmth of the sun revived him, and he crawled weakly to a bush on which grew luscious plums, ate his fill, and slept. When he awoke he felt better and stronger. Perhaps he had been dreaming. The footprints must go on. But no. They came to an end at a grassy edge, and there was no mark to show that human beings had passed that way. He spent that day hunting for a sign of the fugitives, but was unsuccessful and wearily retraced his way to the airbird. The scenery was beautiful. The island rose to a chain of peaks in the center, and beautiful passes and wooded valleys led through the mountains to the further side. The vegetation was purely tropical. Palms breast high grew to the edge of the seashore. The undergrowth showed no sign of any animal inhabitants. Not a twig was broken, not a leaf trampled upon, to mark the passage of a foreign body. Alan made the return journey quickly, and soon found himself at the edge of the bush. But the clory had gone. There were the signs of where she had rested, the mark on the sand of her wheels, an oily patch on the ground showing where her engines had been lubricated. But all sign of her had vanished. Had Wazi Keshta failed him? Or had Clory returned? He felt in his pockets. There was a scrap of paper and a pencil. I'm going inland, he wrote. If you come back, search for me. Alan. He pegged it to the ground close to where the Clory had been anchored, and turning his face westwards, retraced his footsteps. Time passed without his reckoning. When the nights came, he lived for the day, and in the daytime he dreaded the coming of the night. He reached the place where the footsteps ceased at dusk and for the first time for days slept through the night peacefully. His fever had abated, but he still felt curiously weak. 
yet his brain was clear, and he set to work again to hunt carefully for the missing ones. Yard by yard he worked, and at last his patience was rewarded. There, on a bush low on the ground, he saw a piece of something blue that fluttered on the breeze. He stooped and picked it off the twig. It was blue silk, and with a thrill he recognized it as a piece of Clory's dress. Feverishly he looked around him. Alas, there was no other piece to act as a further guide. A thought came to him, and he lay flat on the ground and peered under the bush. There, a grassy avenue unfolded itself before his wondering gaze. It had been completely hidden by the dense woody undergrowth, so it was under this bush they had made their escape, and it was probably in dragging the unconscious girl through that her dress was torn. Alan wormed his way under the bushes, and gasped in wonder at the vista opened out before him. A straight avenue, bordered on either side by thick bushes and overhanging trees, ran perhaps two miles in a straight line. The grass underfoot was soft and velvety, and a narrow streamlet ran over white stones at one side. The bushes were laden with fruit, but even a cursory glance showed that a quantity had been picked quite recently. Twigs bearing fruit had been roughly broken off and trampled underfoot. On went Alan until he reached the end of the avenue, where four paths branched out in four different directions. He hesitated for a second. All four looked like virgin ground, but his eyes were quickened by love, and only love could have noticed a small patch of damp earth close to the water's edge, from where a stone had been kicked aside in a hasty transit. He looked round and saw the stone, its underside still damp, and knew that the fugitives were not too far off. Down the path he went, which twisted and turned, now narrow, now wide again. Suddenly the path also came to an end and thick bushes and low-growing vegetation barred his way. Profiting by his past experience, he tried to peer under the bushes, but could find no sign of an outlet anywhere. All at once there came the sound of voices so close that he turned quickly, expecting to see figures behind him. But there was no one in sight. He listened intently. The voices came again. The Chimernian tongue, which he could understand quite well by this time. We'll leave you here. Spare me, I beg. Leave you here. Call Mervyn, have mercy, mercy. It was all very disjointed, and the sounds seemed to come from every direction. Again he heard his loved one's voice, distorted it is true, but even in the hoarse tones he recognized that it was Clory speaking. Get away, help me. Wyco, help. My father will reward. Wyco. The voice trailed off. Alan was frankly puzzled. The voice came first behind, then before him. Then it seemed to come from heaven itself. A hoarse laugh sounded, Clamervin's. Alan was on the near track at last. Again the maniacal laugh came, fading away in the distance. Alan realized the trick nature had played him. He was listening not to the tones of his loved one or her abductor, but to an echo. The originals might still be many miles away. Madly, he tried to force his way through the undergrowth. It was impossible. All night long he stayed in the little cul-de-sac, and at intervals caught fragments of conversation. Prevent her escaping. Torture her if need be. Love me, Clory. Just love me. Save me, Wyco. Keep you with me always. The madness indeed possessed Colmervin and his friend. When the sun rose, Alan made one more attempt to leave the enclosure. Crawling on his belly, he wormed his way round the roots of the bushes. At last he discovered an opening. He crept through it, low upon the ground. When he got through, a network of pathways confronted him, but it was quite easy to discover the pathway Colmervin had taken. Feeling secure in his flight, he now refrained from attempting to cover his tracks. By the broken grass and branches, the general upheaval of the soil, Alan was convinced that through this part of their retreat they had dragged their unwilling victim along the path, so he ground his teeth and swore softly under his breath. Twisting and turning, the path opened out into a valley, a valley of rocks and stones between two mighty mountains. The scene was desolate, awe-inspiring, dreary, almost terrifying in its grandeur. For perhaps two miles he followed it, until again it narrowed and the character of the scene changed. Once more it was a leafy lane he was traversing that might have been in Devonshire, with its red earth and dainty ferns. At intervals during the day he heard the echo, and it led him on, on to his love. A sound came upon his ear. It was that of voices, real voices this time, no longer an echo. Cautiously he crept from tree to tree. There in the center of a clearing sat Colmervin. His robe was torn, his skin scratched. His eyes held a look of madness. At his feet stretched Wyco, listening eagerly to his friend's counsel. 
and tied to a tree, her fair hair covering her, her garments lying strewn on the ground beside her, torn from her body by her half-met kinsman, Clomarvin, was Clory. Her head was sunk on her breast. She was breathing heavily. Alan dared not move. It was two against one, and he had to save himself for her. Silent as a sleuth-hound, he watched and waited, and even as he did so, Clory lifted her head and gazed across the bodies of the two Kimarnians. Through the leafy spaces their eyes met. Into hers came recognition, followed by a flush of shame, as she shook her hair closer still about her gleaming body. Then she smiled a trustful smile, and dropped her head once more upon her breast. End of section 27 Alan, the Knight Errant Recording by Beth Blakely Section 28 of The Perfect World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Perfect World by Ella Scrimsour, Section 28. The Cave of Whispering Madness. Throughout the night, Alan watched. Never did Kilmervin move from his place in the clearing. Never did his eyes close, nor did he show the slightest inclination to sleep. Towards morning, Wyco raised himself from the ground. He was pitiable to look upon. Led on by a stronger will, the madness had come upon him also. But it was a weaker madness than that which affected Colmervin. It was a madness that chattered and gibbered in the sun, that laughed and cackled insanely, a madness that was pitiful to behold. Alan watched through the leafy branches, and as the dawn rose, many times he met Clory's questioning gaze with looks of encouragement and help. And she knew that when the time was ripe, this strange lord from another world would save and deliver her. As Colmervin still made no attempt to move, Alan wondered whether it would be possible to overpower him. He made a movement, and the slight sound was heard. Colmervin sprang to his feet and looked round, and Alan saw he was clutching a huge limb of a tree, a formidable weapon in a madman's hands. He was evidently not satisfied and peered round the tree trunks carefully. Quietly, Alan crept behind a large bush, and dropping on his belly, he wormed himself underneath it until he was completely hidden. The crackling of a twig was heard by the madman, who with his dormant passions aroused was a dangerous enemy. He spoke sharply to Wyco. "'What sound is that, my Wyco? Is it the stranger that tracketh us?' "'I know not,' said Wyco, shuddering. "'O oh, Colmervin, my friend, let us leave the Ipso Rorca here, and flee from the wrath of her father.' "'Nonsense, my Wyco. When the Rorca is told that his daughter Clory the Fair, Clory the Pure, has spent forty and one nights with us in the darkness, he will be glad to give his soiled goods into my keeping forever. Then in good time I shall become Rorca. Shall I not punish my Clory then for her indifference and insults?' Wyco shuddered. "'My Clory,' cried Colmervin suddenly, his manner changing, "'will you not promise me your hand? Oh, my darling, forgive me. I love you so, I love you.' Give me your hand. Swear before Wyco that you'll take me for your mate. I'll be so good to you. I'll love you so. His voice was pleading. His earnestness could not be doubted. Yet Alan knew it was but a moment's lull in the disordered brain. Clory never answered a word, and her silence drove Colmervin again to threats. Tearing a handful of withes from the side of a running brook, he lashed the captive princess across her legs with the stinging rushes. With an oath, Alan burst from his hiding place and was on the back of his enemy before Colmarvin could recover from his astonishment. Then followed a terrific fight. Alan, with all his knowledge of the scientific sport, was enabled to get in a knockout blow. He parried and thrust and landed Colmarvin a heavy blow under his jaw. His opponent tottered for a moment, but the blow had no lasting effect, and the heavy Camernian struck mightier blows still at his enemy. Wyco was entirely demoralized. He stood watching the fight, his breath coming in gasps, his blue eyes staring, his teeth chattering. As an ally, he was useless to Kilmarvin. As an enemy, he counted as naught to Alan. Clory, tied tightly to the tree, was unable to move. Her wide-open eyes followed the fighters in an agony of spirit, but not a sound came from her lips. True to the tradition of her land, the daughter of the Rorca gave no audible sign of her terror. Alan knew he was weakening. Imperceptibly at first he lost ground, but gradually he realized that his blows had no effect upon the Chimernian. 
His hasty rush into the field of battle was worse than useless. He could no longer help his love. The Chimernian gave him one terrific blow in the stomach. His wind went, he gasped, choked for breath, crumpled up, and sank to the ground. Colmervin left his vanquished enemy's side and went to Wyko, who had been stupidly watching the scene. Watch him, he commanded. If he show any sign of awakening, give him a blow with this. It will be sufficient to put him to sleep again. And he tossed the heavy stick beside the prostrate body. Brutally, he untied the ropes that bound Clory. She was stiff and weak, and the agony as the blood once more coursed freely through her veins was almost more than she could bear. Still, she remained silent, and with a noble gesture of majesty, stooped and drew her mantle of blue about her naked body. Two other garments still lay on the ground. With a sudden thought, she caught one up and drew it within the folds of her cloak. She had a plan. Love had been born to her, in that exquisite moment of agony when she saw Alan knocked down. Her soul cried out within her that here was her maid at last. Her fine sense of belief and trust told her that it was impossible that he was sleeping the sleep of the Serker. Sometime he would rise again, bruised, bleeding, torn perhaps, but rise he would, and come to her aid. Colmervin took her roughly by the arm. Come, said he. Why go? Wait until the Kaimo is full in the heavens. It is but a short time. If Alan the Evil has not moved by then, follow me quickly, always to the east, my friend. Always take the most easterly path, and you will find me. Where are you going? asked Wyko in horror. To the cave of whispering madness, said he, and involuntarily Clory shuddered. Do you know where it is, Michael Mervyn? asked Wyko. Yes. Have I not been there often? Ah, my friend, I arranged that the engine should fail. Ah, oft times should I have been in the Hall of Sorrows, but I came here instead, and of my own free will. I know the place I intend taking you to. I will show you sights. Sights I have seen. Ha ha ha! And with a wild burst of laughter, he dragged his unwilling captive through the bushes and made his way eastward. Wyko remained silent, watching his vanishing friend. His mind was working strangely. The madness had left a deep sense of fear in the heart of Wyko. The inanimate body of Alan seemed to point to his undoing. The blood trickled slowly down the unconscious man's face till there was a little red pool shining wickedly on the green grass. With a cry, Wyko picked up the club and swung it once, twice around his head, but as he would have swung it a third time, it slipped out of his nerveless fingers and went spinning a hundred feet away. With a cry at his loneliness, Wyko turned and fled after Colmervin. In a short space of time he had caught them up, and noticed with surprise that Clory was walking almost willingly with her captor. There was a rope passed round her body, it was true, but it was slack in the center, and although she lagged somewhat behind, there was no need to drag her along. Alan? questioned Colmervin as Wyko reached him. Is Sir Kerr. Good. I struck him, as he rose to hurt me. With one mighty blow I felled him to the ground. The heavy weapon you left me I dashed on his head. Now he lies quiet and cold and bloody. Wyko almost believed his story, and as he recounted it, he looked upon himself as a hero. Tis well, my Wyko, said Colmervin. What say you to that, my Clory? Alan is Sir Kerr. Never more will Kaimo rise upon his smiling face. Never more will he force his presence upon the people of Kimar. He is gone forever from our sight. But Clory made no reply. Only from beneath her mantle could be seen a slight convulsive movement, and from underneath came a tiny tatter of blue that caught on a rosebush and fluttered in the breeze. Birds singing, sweetly smelling flowers, a sense of hunger and thirst— these were the first conscious thoughts Alan had as he opened his eyes on the world once more. He rose from the ground. His head was sore, but the bleeding had ceased. He plucked some luscious fruit that grew low to the ground, and it revived him. Then he tried to think. Clory had been taken from him once more, but he would find her yet. He tenderly touched the tree to which she had been bound, and stooped and picked up the silken garment she had left behind. It was just a piece of soft blue drapery that crumpled into nothingness in his hand. He kissed it reverently. It was part of his love. He looked round wearily. There, attached to a bush, was a piece of something blue. He bent over it. It was part of her gown. Further down, in the very center of the path, was another piece. Well, in the distance, he could see yet a third. It was a sign. Clory was directing him the way she had gone. The trail was difficult to follow. The breeze had blown many pieces away altogether. Others, it had carried away playfully into a wrong direction but by careful watchfulness he discovered the right way. 
and there were always the little pieces of blue to guide him. Then he lost the trail altogether. The last piece of blue was caught on a stone at the bottom of a mighty face of rock. No matter where he looked, there was no shred of blue to cheer him. He ran his hand over the surface of the rock. It was of a reddish sandstone and quite smooth. All around was a low-lying valley with neither a stone nor a tree behind which anyone could hide. He could see for about ten miles, and there was no sign of the fugitives. Backward and forward he walked by the mighty wall of rock, and always his journey ended by the last little flutter of blue. The cliff rose sheer perhaps three hundred feet, and the solid wall extended as far as eyes could reach. It was unthinkable that Kilmervin had scaled the wall, Yet whither had he gone? Suddenly he heard a rumbling noise, the sound of a thousand people whispering, and in front of him a huge slab of rock swung back, revealing a cavity within. The whispering grew louder and louder. He looked round for a hiding place. There was none, so without a moment's hesitation he leapt inside the darkened cavern. A narrow path led downwards, and it was up this path the whispering seemed to be coming, whispering that sounded like a veritable army speaking in hushed tones. There was a piece of rock jutting out. Alan slipped into its embracing shadows and waited. The sounds came nearer and nearer. Then Comervin appeared with Wyko at his side. The voices whispered that a stranger was coming. The voices are never wrong. See, my Wyko. See yonder if Alan the Evil is approaching. The voice whispered and rolled in the darkness. The whole place was unwholesome and terrifying. Comervin followed Wyko into the sunlight. Immediately they were out of sight. Alan slipped from his hiding place and ran swiftly down the narrow passageway. The faster he ran, the faster he drew in his breath, and it seemed as if a thousand men were mocking him. He sighed as his breath caught in his throat. Immediately there were a thousand sighs behind him. Quicker, quicker, he tore down the passage to where he hoped, somewhere, he would find his love hidden. The path was steep and narrow and was in total darkness, and he risked his life in his mad rush through the whispering horrors. He heard the voices again. Colmervin and Wyko had returned. Blindly he rushed on, stumbling here, tripping there, in his haste to reach the Ipso Rorca. The path took an upward turn. He tripped over something. Putting his hands out before him, he felt on the ground. Rough steps had been cut out of the rock. Steadily he mounted upwards, upwards. The darkness was intense, the whispering shadows terrifying. But he never ceased his mad pace. So eager was he to reach Clory. Steadily he ascended the stairs. They seemed interminable. Then in the distance he saw a yellowish spot of light. As he rose higher, it became bigger, until it ended in a blaze of brightness. He had reached the top, and was in an enormous cavern lit by torches and sockets all round the walls. The awful grandeur of the place startled him. In the very center was a huge figure, twenty feet high. It was seated on a throne and had its hands outspread as if in benediction. It possessed a terrible face, cruel, hard, sensual, and the incongruity of the posing of the hands struck Alan at once. Round the cave at equal distances were other figures, all enormous in stature, and possessing in their features the same bestial cruelty and lust. Stalactites hung from the roof, stalactites forty feet long, stalactites fifty feet long, stalactites glorious, yet like deadly serpents with heads outstretched ready to strike. In one corner of the place was a huge beast in stone. Once it had lived, no doubt, now it was fossilized and cold. It was similar to the Ichthyosaurus of prehistoric days, an evil-looking beast in its life, but infinitely more terrible in its stone period. Every movement Alan made was intensified a thousand times in this cave of whispering madness. He realized what the name meant. It could indeed drive the sanest man mad. He realized that he had a fair start of the two Kimarnians, and hurriedly hunted for his lost love. Softly he called, but although her name reverberated from floor to roof, no answering cry took up his challenge. Then whispering voices sounded nearer. Silently he slipped behind the stone monster that had once lived and mated. He was only just in time. Still louder grew the whisperings, and Colmervin and Wyko appeared at the top of the stairway. With the greatest difficulty, Alan was able to distinguish their words. The whisperings were so loud, so sibilant, that the voices sounded like one long hiss. The two Kimarnians came close to the big curved figure in the center of the cave. Colmervin bent low on both knees before the hideous figure. Spirit of our fathers, he cried out. Humbly I pray, take my soul into thy keeping. It is thine, thine forever, but in return, I pray you, grant me Clory's love. See, I sprinkle thee with my blood in ratification of my bond. And with a short knife, he severed a vein in his arm and sprinkled the statue with warm red fluid. Wyko was whispering. 
Mitzor the Mighty, have mercy, have mercy. Fool, cried Colmervin. Why mention that name here? I have bargained with Perox the Killer. I belong to him. Clory shall be mine. You have come thus far with me, my Waiko, but further thou shall go. Down, down, on thy knees before Perox. Admit that he is great, greater than Mitzor. Ask a favor, nay, demand a favor. Seal it with thy blood. Waiko went down on his knees. His face was ashen, he was trembling in every limb. Then came a strange duet, intensified a thousand times by the whispering. Mitzor the Mighty, Perox the Killer, Perox, Mitzor, Mitzor, Perox. In a passion, Colmervin arose and struck Waiko down. Lie there, thou dog, he cried. May thou sleep forever in Circer. I alone am mighty. Perox alone is great. Waiko never moved. He showed no signs of breathing. Had he indeed fallen into the trance-like state that the inhabitants of Kimar so dreaded? It seemed hopeless to Alan that he would ever find Clory in this cavern of horror. He realized at last that Colmervin was a degenerate. The entrance of poor Murdoch had not caused the madness. No doubt he had posed as a good Kimernian, but he suffered from the madness, and deep in his heart even denied the existence of Mitzor the Mighty, the great white glory, and indulged in devil worship and fetish honor. What this cave of whispering madness was, Alan could not conjecture. Perhaps in some far-gone age, fallen Jovians had met here, made the temple for their abominable worship, and lived a second life unsuspected by their friends. That image in the center was their god, Alan was convinced. But how had Colmervin discovered it? Had it been handed down to him from his childhood? Or had he in some way found it for himself? It was pitiful to see a young Kimernian of noble lineage saturated with heathen mythology and heretical dogma. In truth, he was a menace to his companions, living a life of deceit and sin. He was a complex character, for there was much that was sweet and lovable about him, and he was much to be pitied, for when his secret was discovered, he would indeed become a pariah and an outcast. At the moment, he felt he was safe and continued his black sacrifice. For Clory's sake, Alan was forced to witness in silence the horrors that followed. At the foot of the statue was a slab of stone, raised perhaps ten inches from the ground. Upon it were ominous red stains. Quickly Colmervin set about his business. In one corner of the cave were piles of brushwood. These he piled high under the stone slab. With a mighty effort, he lifted the senseless Waiko upon it, and rested his head in a tiny curve at one end. Alan shuddered to see how it fitted the neck. The use of the slab was plain to see. He set fire to the wood by one of the torches, and the smoke curled up and the wood hissed and sizzled. When the fire was safely alight, Colmervin went to a corner of the cavern and touched a hidden spring. A door opened and revealed a flight of steps inside leading below. As soon as he was out of sight, Alan rushed from his hiding place, lifted Wyko from the altar, and hid him behind the mammoth fossil. But the noise of his movements was magnified a thousandfold by the hideous whispering echoes of the place. Wyko was still and quiet. He scarcely breathed and Alan dared not try to revive him. Colmervin returned, bearing in his arms a precious burden in blue. Alan started and leaned forward. His darling was not unconscious, but was submitting to the indignity put upon her with her usual patience. At the altar he stopped in frozen amazement. The stone was beginning to show red. The deadly fire should have begun its work, but the altar was empty. He looked round. There was no one in sight. With a cry of rage, he let go the rope to which Chloe was fastened, put her to the ground, and darted to the head of the stairway leading to the cave's entrance, and the yells of his curses and imprecations rose on the air in volumes of sinister whisperings. Alan was but six feet from his dear one. With a mighty rush, he leapt from his hiding place and caught Chloe in his arms. He made for the secret door through which Colmervin had brought her. Colmervin heard the sounds and was just in time to see two figures disappearing through the little door. With another oath, he strode across the cave, but the figures had a big start. They had closed the door behind them, and his fingers hesitated over the secret lock, so he was delayed by his own impatience and anger. Clory had given herself up for lost, and when she felt two strong arms encircle her, a vague terror came over her, but even as she was lifted up, a voice whispered in her ear, "'Have no fear. Tis I, Alan. Trust yourself to me, and I will save you.' Her emotion was too great for her to speak but she let herself nestle in comfort in the arms of the powerful stranger. The door clanged behind them, more stairs, very narrow. Down Alan went, and the darkness gave place to a faint light. "'Where are we?' asked Alan. "'I don't know, but there is a cave down here which is kept padlocked. It was there I was imprisoned.' Alan looked round quickly. The passage had widened and openings led off on either side. Immediately in front of them seemed to come the daylight. "'Can you run?' he asked tenderly. 
Yes, yes. Oh, to be free of Colmervin. Through the dim light they went. The whisperings were not quite as bad as in the upper cave, but still they were quite fearsome enough. They seemed to people the place with dead men, men who laughed and jeered and pointed their clammy fingers at their victims. But upon the whisperings came a more fearful sound, Colmervin's laughter. Hurry, hurry, my princess. I cannot, she breathed. My heart beats. It hurts me to talk. Without a word, he picked the light burden again up in his arms and made off at a still greater pace. She flung one arm round his neck and clung to him confidingly. Nearer came the laughter. It was so close that it seemed almost on top of them. Ella never forgot that journey. With his precious burden in his arms, he hurried onward, always following the light, and nearer and nearer came the footsteps of the madman. At last they turned a corner, the cave opened out, and they saw Kaimo, shining in all his glory. The sea was breaking gently on the golden shore. There was plenty of shelter near. Rocks abounded, and the vegetation was thick. Alan ran to where a dozen rocks, man-high, rose from the seashore. There was in one a crevice that was wide enough to admit Clory. Stay there, he whispered. Oh, don't leave me. I won't leave you for long, I promise you. But I want to watch for Colmervin. Take care of yourself, she pleaded. Oh, run no risks, I pray. With a quick glance round, Alan left the shelter of the rocks. No one was in sight. Colmervin had not shown himself. Quickly, Alan made his way to the cave from which they had emerged. He entered it, and to his amazement found it had no exit. Solid walls blocked his way. It was just a hollowed-out rock on the sands going inland, perhaps ten or twelve feet only. Alan was perplexed. He had marked it, as he thought, by a big colored boulder at its entrance but upon careful examination he found there were dozens and dozens of such boulders all over the beach. Stepping from his hiding place, he walked to the next cave. That, upon examination, proved to go deep into the earth, but it was not the cave from which they had escaped into the open. Wildly he rushed up and down. Twenty, thirty caves he encountered, all like, very like, the one he was seeking. Some had narrow passages that twisted and turned and ended in a cave next door. Others went further, and after many serpentine turnings, brought him back to the place from which he had started. He knew he was in a dangerous position. Any one of these caves might hold Colmervin, an observer but unobserved. Rapidly, Alan made up his mind. With Clory, he would leave the cave district altogether. They would strike inland. If they were still on the island, they would endeavor to find their way back to where the airbird had been anchored. That Wazi Kestra would return, Alan was convinced, and when he did so, they would be saved. Having made up his mind, he began to retrace his footsteps, but a hoarse burst of laughter startled him. He rushed to the mouth of the cave. There, sailing away to sea in a frail craft, was Colmervin. It was just a raft he was on with a tiny makeshift sail, but it was not at Colmervin that Alan was staring horror-stricken, incredulous, but at a blue figure near the helm, a little blue figure that was tied to a post to which the mainsail was fastened, a little blue figure that held out her arms imploringly to the shore. Alan could only stare and stare, incredulous, unbelieving, but the little craft grew smaller and smaller as it was tossed on the waves. Alan rushed to the rocks. The crevice was empty. Clory had once more been snatched from his arms. End of section 28. The Cave of Whispering Madness. Recording by Beth Blakely. Section 29 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Perfect World by Ellis Grimsauer, Section 29. The Wraiths of the Rorkas. Alan remained motionless, watching the little craft vanish from his ken. He was thinking hard. Colmervin had so far got the better of him but the game was not yet won. It might be checked to the king, but Alan was far from being mated. His eye searched the beach. There was nothing in sight, neither boat nor sailing craft. He looked behind him at the many yawning cavern entrances. He was still in doubt as to the one which led to the cave of whispering madness. He clenched his hands together till the knuckles showed white. There he was, alone on an island, impotent, useless, while the woman he loved was in the hands of a madman, and in danger not of death as he knew it, but of dishonor, disgrace, and perhaps, circer itself. There was a mist at sea, and already the little bark had been swallowed up in its gray folds. Nothing was in sight on the broad expanse of water. He looked above him. He saw no air bird in the heavens, its body gleaming in the light. 
On the island there was no trace of humanity but himself. Hope seemed far away. Then suddenly he remembered Comervin's words. Take the most easterly path, my Waiko, always to the east. Unconsciously he turned to the left and walked quickly across the sands. A great promontory of rock stood out before him, hiding from sight the next little bay. He strode towards it and found it was impossible to get round it. Already the water was too deep, so he made up his mind to scale it. Clambering up the slippery rocks, he at length reached the top. There before him lay the whole stretch of the coastline. Tiny bays, little rivulets coming down narrow valleys and emptying themselves at last in the sea, rugged headlands and grassy slopes all took their place in the picture. None of these things, however, focused themselves upon his mind. One thing only he saw, and one thing only drew him helter-skelter over the rugged rocks. A tiny boat, almost like the Rob Roy canoe he favored in his varsity days, lay drawn high up on the beach, and near it a little log cabin was built at the water's edge. Hurriedly he made his way to the little hut and knocked loudly on the door. There was no reply, and he tried it. It opened at his touch. He entered it. It was deserted, but he soon had proof of its owner. Upon the wall hung a beautiful painting of Clory, and it was signed, Comervin, from his kinswoman, Clory. On a table by the window was a pile of books, and on the fly-leaf of nearly every one was written in a strong hand, Comervin, Taz Ak, of the House of Pluthos. Mostly, the books were on astronomy, and Alan noticed with amusement one was called Quilfus, or the most important, unimportant planet. Quilfus, Terra, his world, once his all, now nothing. He looked round the room. A door led on one side to the sleeping apartment, and on the other to the kitchen and offices. The whole place was tastefully furnished and showed signs of frequent use. Alan hurried to the seashore. The little craft was called the Clory. He sprang into it and pushed off. In the bow he saw a tiny engine with three levers. He was already slightly acquainted with the simple Chimernian machinery, so he pulled one down with assurance. Instantly the boat skimmed along the water at a terrific speed. Hastily he touched the second. A slower pace resulted, and the third stopped the boat altogether. With the first speed on, he plowed out to the horizon. He could see no trace of Clomervin. The sea was desolate and bare. He felt hopeless. Had Clomervin swamped the boat, and were he and Clory now lying dead at the bottom of the sea? Death? He knew the Jovians had no death, yet surely they were not immune from drowning. Perhaps they would remain on the sea's bed. Serker. The thought maddened him, and savagely he turned the boat first this way then that, in his hopeless endeavor to find the fugitives. Kaimo had sunk. Darkness was setting in. He could see the faint outlines of the hut. Suddenly two beams of light shone out from its windows, which were suddenly obscured. Colmervin had doubtless returned. Quickly he turned the boat towards shore. He drew close in and beached her without a sound. Quietly he crept up to the open window and moved the heavy curtain ever so slightly. There was Colmervin in his easy chair, reading a book, but he was alone. A knock sounded and a man appeared. Do you want refreshment now, my lord? he asked. Yes, Eric, at once. Shall I take refreshment to the lady, your mate? No, Eric, but stay. Take her a glass of wine and, fumbling on his table, melt this pellet in it. She will fall asleep. When she is asleep, carry her hither and place her in my room. Tis my wedding night, Eric. I have an unwilling bride, it's true, but before Perrux the killer, my mate shall she be this night. Eric smiled evilly. Tis well, my lord. I will do thy bidding. When you have brought her hither, stand sentinel at the rocky ledge. If Alan the evil should appear, strike him down, bind him, and acquaint me. Should that happen to him, then Perrox the killer again will have a victim. Silently Eric left the room to return almost immediately with a tray laden with food. Where did you go this midday, Eric? asked his master. To the cave of whispering madness, my master. I built the sacrificial pyre beneath the altar. Everything is in readiness. I hardly expected you so soon. Two chimos should have passed before you came. The pyre is ready? Good. But what did you with the chlory? Tis on the beach, as it always is. Nay, said Colmervin. When I landed at the covered bay, I dragged my unwilling bride by way of the beach. The chlory was not there, and I thought you must have sailed to the mainland for food. It is there, I swear, my lord. Colmervin looked puzzled. Could Alan have found it and... He began, then... Go quickly, Eric, and see... Alan slipped round the corner of the hut, and in the darkness stood flush with the wall, completely hidden. He saw the figure of Eric run lightly down the beach, heard him get into the boat, and as quickly return. He reached his coin of vantage in time to hear Eric say, 
It is there, my lord. I saw and touched it. It has moved its position slightly, but the wind has been rather high today. Otherwise, it was as I left it. That puling girl has taken my senses away, grumbled Comervin. I can think of naught but her. Go, Eric, fetch her here. But remember, give her the wine first. When she awakens, she will have become my mate. And he chuckled hoarsely. Alan was in a quandary. He scarcely knew what to do. Was the secret way into the place where Clory was hidden in the cabin or not? He wormed his way round the hut, and as he did so, he saw a door open, and in the ray of light a figure crossed to a little lean-to shed that had been built against some high ground. He gave Eric a moment or two of grace, and then followed him in. There on the floor was an open trap door with some steps leading from it into the unknown below. A length of cord was in the corner of the shed. Alan picked it up, and then followed Eric. At the foot of the steps, a subterranean passage led for some distance, and then opened out into a large cave. He remembered it. It was the one immediately under the secret exit in the cave of whispering madness. He saw Eric in front of him. He had taken a key from his waist and had undone a heavy metal door. Silently, Alan crept nearer and nearer to him. He heard the sound of liquid being poured into a glass. He heard Clory's gentle word of thanks. Now he could see the grim tragedy. Clory had finished the wine and was now swaying to and fro. She tottered and fell onto a low couch in a corner of her prison. Eric watched her until he was convinced she was fast asleep. Then he put the wine bottle down and bent over the prostrate girl. He remembered no more. A mighty blow rendered him unconscious, and Alan tied up his unresisting foe and left him helpless upon the ground. Tenderly he raised Clory and bent over her. He was aching to kiss her sweet lips, but he remembered her anguished cry. Not my lips! Clomervin, not my lips! No, until she offered them of her own free will, they should remain sacred to him. He knew she would sleep deeply for some time, so he examined his quarters. Clory's cell was hewn out of the solid rock, with nothing in it but a chair, a table, and a settee. There was the passage leading to the log cabin, the one with a glimmer of light that led, he knew, to the seashore, and the one to the cave above. To the right there was a tiny passage that looked almost like a crack in the rock. He peered through. It led on into the distance, and he was determined to try that. Eric had carried a lamp which gave a good light. Alan picked it up, lifted Clory gently, and started down the passage. He wondered whether it would lead to safety or to adventures even more horrible than many of those he had been through. He held Clory tightly. He was determined not to lose her again. Again the passage opened out into a cave, narrowed, and a still larger cave came into view. He saw a niche high up in the wall, and with his precious burden he managed to reach it in safety. He found himself on a high narrow ledge, where they could rest in safety from the machinations of Colmervin. Clory woke to find her head supported by a strong arm, and her hands held between two firm ones. She looked up. Alan, she breathed, and made a tiny movement towards him. My Clory, he murmured, and their lips met in one warm long kiss. Oh, my darling, you really love me, he said brokenly at last. My Alan, I know not the customs of your world. In mine, it is shame to a maid who offers her lips before she is wed. Indeed, a maid would never be thus. And she slipped from the circle of his arm. Even were she sworn to wed, I know not your customs, my Alan. But I am Ipso Rorca, and my father's child. I, I love you, Alan. And you'll be my wife? he asked tenderly. Shyly she hid her face on his breast. In truth, my Alan, tis sweeter far to be asked than asked. I am glad you are of a different world, for your wooing is stronger and yet more sweet than ours. Oh, willingly, willingly, Alan, will I marry you? Alan had at last met and won his ideal, and he caressed and murmured sweet nothings to her, until they forgot they were fugitives, forgot that a madman would soon be on their trail, forgot aught but the joy of the present and the hope of the future. Clory recovered herself first. Shyly she slipped her little hand into Alan's. My loved one, said she, my father the Rorca knows not of Clomervin and his sin. We must escape, reach him, and for the safety of the community, for the traditions of our dear land, we must send Clomervin to the Hall of Sorrows. My Clory, nothing will purge him of his sin. He is mad, quite mad. But he must go away all the same. See what unhappiness he has caused already? See what he may do in the future? You are right. He must be put away. He has money, position, and cunning. Where are we, my Alan? I know not where this leads, said Alan, but it is the only road I dared take. Hungry, tired, and worn, they crept along the little narrow ledge. 
Suddenly a cave, lighted from without through slits in the wall, burst on their view, and Clory gave a startled exclamation. "'The hall of our fathers!' she cried. "'I have been here before!' "'What is it?' "'This is the place where the regalia of each reigning Rorka is placed, together with his throne when he has left the fair land of Kimar through the sacrament of Schlerlikitata. Round the cave were thrones of all descriptions, some in heavy marble, others in gold adorned with precious jewels, others just simple wooden thrones that showed their antiquity. "'Down! Down on your knees!' cried Clory, and Alan realized that the cave had become alive with living figures." The thrones were occupied by men who wore crowns of gold and jewels, and who carried scepter and orb in their hands. The cave that had been dead and cold only a minute before was now alive, but there was no sound. All was hushed and still, and the figures were shadowy and unreal. "'Oh, my mitzer, breathed Clory, "'the joy! To think I should have been permitted to witness this scene, to see the wraiths of my forefathers! My Alan, watch! Read a meaning in this visitation, for it augurs well!' Alan felt unable to move. He was petrified at the sight before him, at the ghostly pageant of years gone by. Slowly the Rorkas, kings of eons past, rose from their thrones and walked in single file to the end of the cave. There they ranged themselves on either side of a slightly raised platform of rock. They prostrated themselves and Alan saw a thin vapor rise and, like a curtain, shut out from sight the little stage. Then it lifted, and through the shadowy film he saw strange figures disporting themselves amid the strange scenery. Then all at once he realized that he was watching shadowy figures of himself and Desmond and Mavis. He saw their little college at Eric Head. He witnessed their hasty flight in the Argenta. Once more he saw the destruction of the world, his world. But this time it was different. Like a tiny star it shone white and bright, then it shivered, turned red like a tiny ball of fire in the sky, burst into a thousand different pieces, and then disappeared from sight. And as it disappeared, the scene clouded again, and the filmy curtain of haze shut out the picture from his sight. The scene changed once more he saw himself as an actor on the stage, but this time he was a minor character in the drama. Colmervin was the villain, and played the chief character. He witnessed their meeting in the little lane. He watched the flight of the airbird, Clory, the descent and the abduction of Ipsororka, so the play went on until one more picture showed clearly before him. He saw Clory, Clory in a gown of diaphanous white with a crown of gold upon her head. By her side he stood, crowned with an orb in hand, and between them stood a child, a man-child who bore traces of his mother's beauty and his father's strength. Then darkness came upon the scene, and Alan drew his trembling love still closer beside him. Then the wraiths of the Rorkas became faint and misty, and when next he looked, they had vanished from sight. "'We shall win through, my Alan,' said Clory. "'The wraiths of our Rorkas never show themselves except to the favored few. "'Do you know the way out from here?' "'Yes. Straight through yonder archway a passage leads to the sea. "'We are not far from Hormori. "'The island is Waro, the Isle of Joy. "'It is a safe place for Colmervin to have chosen for his madness. "'No one would have sought for evil here.' How far is Hormori, then? From where we emerge into the light, we shall see the citadels and towers of my home. Oh, Alan, the joyous moment when I can take you by the hand and lead you to my father, my chosen one, my love. How shall we reach the mainland? We must light a beacon on the shore. Fire is a signal, and someone will row across to us. In a short while they emerged through a tiny door out onto the beach. They gathered sticks and laid them crosswise upon each other until they were man-high, and then set the pile ablaze. At length came a sign from the distant shore where white minarets gleamed in the light and golden cupolas rose high in the air. There rose against the whiteness of the scene tall tongues of flame and curling smoke. Their answer, said Clory. Someone will soon come now. They watched a craft put out to sea. They saw the pale green sails grow clearer and nearer. Soon they could distinguish the crew. Clory ran down to the sea's edge and stood gaily clapping her hands. The little launch beached with a groan and a rattle, and Awaz stepped out. "'We saw your signal,' he began. Then a look of recognition came over his face, and he fell on one knee and clasped the princess's hand, and impressed a loyal kiss upon it. "'Oh, my Ipsororka, he cried. "'We have mourned you as Serker. No tidings could we get of you. Mornings and tears have been in Hormori for ten and one Kaimos. The Rorka has shut himself within the precincts of his palace, and neither eats nor drinks.' but sits always alone, silent and quiet and drear. Thank you for your welcome, my Waz. I have had strange adventures since I left my father's house. These I will tell my people when the right moment arrives. But first, lead me to my father. The journey to the mainland occupied a very short space of time, 
and Waz Okuyar obtained a boar for the Ipso Rorca. I shall not forget you, Waz Okuyar, said Clory. Reward shall be given you for your speedy assistance to me. Nay, my princess, it is a joy to have served you. Hormori proved to be even more beautiful than Miniviar. The streets were wider and the buildings more magnificent. The boar stopped outside a marble building. I told him to stop here, whispered Clory. It is better that I break the news to my father myself of my safe return. They passed through a noble courtyard into a lovely garden. Our own private apartments. I shall be able to get to my father unnoticed. Through a little door, up a short flight of stairs, and down a narrow corridor, a heavy curtain of blue hung outside a doorway. Clory lifted it gently. Alan drew back. Much as he loved her, he could not intrude at such a sacred moment. Father! My child! My child! There was the sound of kissing, a whispered conversation, and then Alan heard his name. Slowly he entered the room, and at last was face to face with the Rorca, king of all Jupiter, but above all, father of his loved one. The majesty of Rorca overwhelmed him, and he bent his knee in homage. Nay, rise, said a gentle voice, musical, benign, soothing. Rise and greet me, O oh my Alan, for Clory has told me you are to be my son. End of section 29 The Wraith of the Rorcas Recording by Beth Blakely Section 30 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid. The Perfect World by Alice Grimsour. Section 30. The Fate of Colmervan. Cormori was rejoicing. The princess, Clory the Ipso Rorco, was found. Not only was she alive and well, but she had found her mate. True, he was from another world, but she loved him, and the Jovians, like the men of Terra, dearly loved a romance. The wedding day was fixed, telepathic messages had been sent to Sir John, and he and his party were coming to Hurmori as guests of the Rorca. The Rorca was very troubled over Colmervan. Never in the history of Kimar had such a terrible tale of iniquity been told. His cunning, his audacity, his double life was a terrible blow to the proud old Kimarnian. Wazi Jesta was thankful to welcome Alan back. Day after day, he had circled over the island and sent search parties to find the missing ones. The Isle of Wero, which was joined to the larger isle by a narrow strip of sand, they left unexplored. It was holy ground. Consequently, they missed the log cabin of Colmervan. Wazi Kesta, Alan, and a staff of twenty men embarked on the Clory and flew to Colmervan's retreat. They landed close to the hut and although firearms were unknown to Kimar, they, on Alan's advice, protected themselves with heavy sticks and carried thick silken ropes. They found the hut empty and signs of a hasty retreat. From the little house they crossed to the lean-to and descended into the subterranean passage. They ascended the steps to the Cave of Whispering Madness and forced the door open. The cave was empty. Alan looked behind the huge fossil animal and hoped to find the body of Waco, but it had gone. Ominous footprints on the sandy floor proved that his body had been found, and Colmervan and Eric had dragged him back to the altar. As they reached the slab of stone, Yekeshka gave a cry of horror. As they reached the slab of stone, Yekeshka gave a cry of horror. See, my Alan? Mitzer, have mercy! There on the altar were the charred remains of what had once been a man. The bones were twisted into horrible forms, as if, in their last convulsive agony, they had writhed in vain on the table of fire. One bony arm hung over the side. Every scrap of flesh had been burnt from it. Even the tips of the finger bones were missing. The skull was hairless. The eyes had been scorched from their sockets. It was a horrible sight, and Alan shivered. Who is it? asked Yekeska. I am afraid it was Waco. Heaven grant he was Serker when that madman found him. Gentle hands attempted to move the charred remains from the bed of pain, but they fell to powder as they were touched. The whisperings in the cave served to make the horrors more intense, and the Camarnians turned their heads as they passed the human sacrifice. Down the steps they all traveled, but no trace of Colmervan could they find. They forced the outer entrance to the cave. 
but although they hunted through the leafy byways and hidden avenues, he continued to evade them. Again the cave was searched, and the Waz was inclined to give up the task. "'Is it possible?' asked Alan at last. "'That he is hiding in the place of the wraiths of the Yorkas?' "'No. Nothing evil could live in the presence of our holiest men.' "'Nevertheless, I'd like to go there,' suggested Alan. The Waz shrugged his shoulders. "'As you will, my Alan. Remember, of all Kimarnians, only the Rorkas can visit again the home of their life. They would not show themselves to such a thing of evil as Comervan has become. But at the entrance to the holy place they saw Comervan. Stiff he was standing, and upon his face was a frozen look of horror. Yakeshka fell to his knees. "'The wraiths!' he cried. A cloud of haze had passed away, and upon the little stage was being enacted a drama. High in the air a great white cloud hovered. It was pink-tipped with a golden glory shining through. At either side were lesser clouds, but all tinged with the glory at roseate hue. And in chains beneath them stood the astral figure of Colmervan, surrounded by Kimarnians who had gone before. And as they watched, his clothes melted away, and naked and ashamed he stood before his judge, the great white glory. Gradually a dusky shadow seemed to come over the gleaming body, Darker and darker it grew until it was black. Not the black of an African native, but a cruel black. A thick black that was horrible to look upon. So evil was its appearance. Then all the Camarnians shrank away from the solitary evil figure standing alone before the glory. The shadowy figure of Colmerban looked round him wildly and threw out his hands in supplication. It was no use. His prayers were too late. A yawning pit showed up bright with flames. Yellow tongues of flame licked round the mouth. Long red flames danced together in riotous harmony. Then out of the terrible place appeared a figure, so terrible that Alan closed his eyes and strove at once to forget it. A figure that was neither man nor animal, but part of both. A creature with bloodshot eyes and a baleful smile, with teeth that looked like fangs, with arms that twisted and twirled like evil serpents. Nearer and nearer the figure drew, until, radiating with heat, it drew close to Colmervan. There was a mighty noise. The great white cloud vanished, leaving the scene in a pitchy darkness. Only the fiery cavern gleamed and glistened. The venomous figure put a sinewy arm about the form of Colmervan. There was a crackling noise, the hideous smell of burning flesh, and the picture vanished as the two figures disappeared into the fiery jaws. Then Yekyesha spoke. The great white glory has judged. We cannot punish him now. There was a fearsome shriek, and Colmervan rushed from the cave and fell prostrate on the ground outside. Yekeshka stooped over him. The body was rigid, the eyes fast closed. Sirkor has descended upon him, said the Waz. Righteousness has spoken. With an odd feeling, Alan watched them pick up the body and carry it to the air bird and as they did so, a mighty roar filled the air. There was a sound as of thunder, a blinding flash, then silence. The cave of whispering madness had gone. Shivered to atoms, there was nothing but a hillock of rocks and sand to mark the last resting place of Waco the unfortunate. The little passage to the sacred cave alone remained perfect. When the last shock of the earthquake had subsided, Eric the servant came out from his hiding and threw himself upon the mercy of Alan. Firmly he was bound and taken to the quarry, there to await the judgment of the Rorca. My son, said the Rorca when he had been told the whole story. Colmervan was shown his future punishment. He may not be suffering now, for he is in the unhappy state of Sirkor. But some day, when he leaves this world, his time of pain will come. A case of glass shall be made to hold his cold and rigid body, and the hall of sorrows shall be placed as a living testimony to the fruit that is garnered by evil. To Fergipo that accursed shall be taken, there to remain until he changes the state of Sirkor for his lasting punishment. End of section 30section 31 of The Perfect World this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid. 
The Perfect World by Ellis Grimsour, Section 31, The Sentence Upon Eric. Sir John, with Masters, Desmond, and Mavis, arrived at Hurumori in time for the trial. They were much interested in Alan's adventures and were looking forward to witnessing the spectacle of Jovian justice. Mavis and Clory were already warm friends, and the Rorca insisted on the strangers occupying suites of apartments in his palace. Baby John Allen had grown into a fine boy. Now nearly four, he toddled about the palace and chattered away in a quaint mixture of Kimarnian and English. The grown-ups seldom used English now. Their past life seemed to be fading away entirely. They were already acclimatized to Jupiter and looked upon it as their home. Mavis, at the bottom of her heart, however, did not forget all the pretty customs in which she had been brought up from childhood, and she it was who introduced a trousseau as a necessary adjunct to a wedding. Clory took up the idea with fervor, and in future all society weddings had trousseau, cakes and honeymoons as essential parts of their festivities. Clory's mother had heard the call of Charluc Itata when she was but a small child, and possessing no near feminine relatives, the Kimarnian princess was glad to have Mavis helping her at the happiest time of her life. All was bustle and rush at the palace. The wedding was to be a grand affair, but before it took place, Eric had to answer publicly the charges that were brought against him. In the large justice hall on the day appointed, the Rorca took his seat wearing his purple robes of justice. A fanfare of trumpets announced his arrival with his postilions and servants and attaches. All wore full court dress, and the whole scene was picturesquely brilliant. Alan had not yet been admitted to the highest circles in Jovian society. His honor was to come on his wedding day, so to meet the exigencies of the case, a special raised seat had been placed at the right hand of the Rorca, and there Alan sat in state and watched the proceedings. There were neither lawyers nor barristers in this wonderful land of harmony. The case for the defense, if so it could be called, was taken by the high priest, and for the prosecution by the highest Jo in the whole of Kimar. The Rorca listened to the statements made on both sides, and gave his sentence as he thought fairest. No appeal could be made afterwards, his judgment was final. Never had there been such a case as this one. Eric had broken the traditions of his land. If the Rorca adjudged him guilty, he would take his punishment stoically. The Rourke arose, and the silence in the court was profound. "'Bring in Eric the Miserable,' he cried, and Eric appeared in the prisoner's garb of an ugly neutral tint. This garment of shame was worn only by prisoners when charged with some heinous offense. It was something of the shape of a Jewish gabardine. About his waist the prisoner wore a hempen rope, his head was covered with a hood, and there were sandals upon his feet. "'Oh, Eric,' said the Rorca, Take your seat upon the penitent's chair, for you are accused by this court of most grievous dealings. If you are found guilty, a terrible fate awaits you. Speak first, Lamy, Doge of al Kimar. Read your charge first. And Jo Lamy, a dignified old greybeard, stepped forward and read from a parchment. Rorca, most mighty, by the grace of Mitzar, Kimarnians one and all, I charge Eric the Miserable with grievous sins. Whether he alone is responsible or whether responsibility rests with another, unnamed but now in a state of circwar, remains to be proved. First I charge Eric with idolatry and devil worship. Nay more, I charge him with the greatest offense of all against Mitzer, the offense of offering black sacrifices, the sacrifice of living bodies, to Perix the killer, a graven image of hideous aspect. I charge him with acting as assistant in that temple of sin and death. I charge him as a heretic and a heathen. He, a born believer in the one and only creator, is a deserter from his faith. I charge him with aiding the unnamed, now circwer, in his horrible nefarious practices. All these charges are with regard to his sins against Mitzer. Now I charge him with attempting to lay hands on the precious person of our loved princess, with offering her wine that was drugged, and being a party to keeping her a captive against her will. Above all, I charge him with trying to aid the unnamed, now Sirquir, to soil her purity, and thus to cause her to wed one she did not love. These, O'Rourke, are the sins in brief, 
and a more hideous category of evil I have never before had to repeat. Although I am old and my call must come soon, this is the saddest day of my life to think I have to utter such things against a true Kimarnian. He sat down, and then rose up Miss Rath the high priest. O Rorka, the mighty and the just, I cannot deny the charges that Lamy has brought. Long have I talked with Eric the miserable, and it is hard to offer even a word in his favor. Yet because of thy justice I beg of you to hear me out, and I will tell the tale of sorrow and shame. Eric and the unnamed, now Sir Quir, were foster brothers. The mother of the unnamed received her call while her babe was yet a suckling, and these two babes, suckled from the same breast, drew the food of life from the same woman. As toddling mites they flew their kites together, and threw their balls. Then the sire of Eric, Meol, now Sir Quir, took these suckling babes to the temple of Pyrrhox the killer. It is he I blame, not the innocent ones. He, with two others, lived a life of lies. Respected Kimarnians, wise fathers, loving husbands, they lived unsuspected of their evil practices, for they were all devil worshippers and offered up the black sacrifice. But Sirkwar took them all into his bosom. These tender nurslings grew in the ways of sin. He, the unnamed, possessed brains and cunning. He was the leader. He it was who took Eric the miserable onto our Isle of Holiness, made him build him a hut, and left him there, a tool to work his will and prepare his heathen rites. Since he was of tender years he has led this life, hating it, yet loving it, fearing it, yet welcoming it. Then the time came when he, the unnamed, whispered words that affrighted even Eric the miserable, whispered words of passion for a princess. The Ipso Rorca was named, and even to that length of degradation would Eric have assisted, so deep was he in the toils of sin. Then the day of reckoning came. Mighty thunders shook the cave of darkness. The wrath of Midster tore it asunder. No more shall these perfidious practices be handed down from father to son. No longer shall sin creep out unseen in Kimar. The great white glory has spoken. The temple of sin is in ruins, and under the mass of rock and stones lies the tortured body of Waco. Whether he, too, had practiced the sins of the unnamed also, we do not know. But we do know his character was weak. We pray that his suffering on the black altar may have purged his soul, and that soon he will be sitting in the warmth of the Tower of Help. Miss Rath sat down, and the Rourke arose. I have heard your case, O Eric, in silence. I have listened to your tale of shame. One thing only is in your favor. You sought not an evil life, but sin and its sorrows were taught you when you were yet a child. But, he paused, you lived the life of Kimar. You attended our services of joy that were offered to Mitzer. You knew sin was abhorrent to us. From the time when our first parents populated our world, we have fought to keep Kimar perfect. Thanks to Mitzer, we nearly succeeded. It is to prevent the occurrence of sins like yours that I pronounce sentence. Miss Rath, high priest of our temples, our mediator on earth between Mitzer and man, robe the sinner in the garments of shame. Immediately the gray-tinted gabardine was torn from Eric, and in its place was put a long robe of black. The covering was taken from his head, and the sandals from his feet. His head was bowed in shame, and in shame he was led to the sentence bar, there to hear his fate. Through the streets of Humori shalt thou be led, said the Rorca. A rope round thy middle shall direct thee the way to go. Neither man nor woman shall speak to thee. Neither beast nor bird shall be permitted to fawn upon thee. Alone and an outcast shalt thou be sent upon thy way. Lonely shalt thy days be. Lonely shalt thou be taken to the Hall of Sorrows at Fijipo. There thou shalt live until thy beard grows and turns white with age. Should thy call come early, alone wilt thou have to meet the great white glory. No sacrament shall help thee on thy way. Neither incense nor prayers shall assist thee in thy last moments here. Alone and wretched thou shalt leave this world. But should thy call not come soon, then shalt thou stay in the Hall of Sorrows, until thy beard covers thy face and thy middle. Then, when that time arrives, shalt thou be free to leave the place of sorrow. But thy life will be lonely all thy days for the sins thou hast committed. Miss Rath rose. 
O my Rorca, thy wisdom is sound, thy judgment just. May I ask but one favor for the guilty Eric. During his time of sorrows, should he perform two noble deeds, wouldst thou reconsider thy verdict and allow him freedom? Yes, Miss Rath. Should he perform two noble deeds, deeds that mark him as a true son of Kimar, then publicly shall his punishment be remitted him, and once more shall he take his place among the people he has wronged. I have spoken. The Rorka rose from his seat of justice, and with another fanfare of trumpets took his place in his state pure and drove to the palace. Alan waited to see the end. The wretched Eric was led from his place and taken through a side entrance out onto the highway. There a rope was twisted round his waist, a rope that had six ends. Six men took hold of each end, and dragging it taut, led him through the streets. On he went, a misery to himself and to those that saw him. An airbird was made ready for the journey to Fujibo. Alan begged that he might accompany it. He wanted to see for himself what the Hall of Sorrows was really like. He had no conception of it. Was it like a Pentonville, or Portland in England, or did it possess some horror that no ordinary human mind could conceive? Go then, said the Rorka to Alan. Swift be thy journey there, and a swift return. Just time shalt thou have before the day arrives when Mithrath shall make my child and thee one, one on earth and one in heaven. Farewell, said Clory, when Alan told her of the journey he was to make. Tis customary in Kimar for a bride to withdraw herself from all for twelve chemos before her wedding day. During that time she thinks and meditates on her future state. I go into silence tomorrow, Alan, and my prayers will be all for you. May you return to me in safety. Farewell. End of section 31Section 32 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid. The Perfect World by Ella Scrimsour. Section 32. The Hall of Sorrows. The air struck cold, and Alan was glad of the heavy cloaks that the Rorka insisted on his taking for the journey. They had passed through glorious scenery, but now it was changing. No longer was the air sweet and balmy. No longer were the fields below covered with beautiful flowers. Great stretches of bare and rocky country took the place of the fields, and snow-topped hills looked down on the desolation. Then Frigipo hove in sight. One great building dominated the scene. Of a dark gray stone it looked gloomy and forbidding. Colmervan, still in the state of Sircor, had been brought in a coffin of glass, and Alan felt the awful loneliness of the place when he saw the coffin being unshipped, preparatory to being placed in the hall of that dreadful abode. The Waz, who was in command of the journey, held the only key to the heavy gates, and as he unfastened them, a drear wailing rose from within. Eric was dragged along, pushed inside the gate, and then left, to learn how to fend for himself in that gloomy place. Carefully the Colmervan placed upon a huge pedestal in the hall. His face had lost its youthful candor, its beauty of outline, and its peace. The visage seen through the glass was the face of an old man worn with sin, evil and sinister. Alan shuddered as he turned away from the coarsened form. The state of Sirkwar, as known by the Kimarnians, was a very dreadful thing. Struck down in life, the victims assumed a trance-like form from which they never recovered. Real death the Jovians knew not. A far happier parting was permitted them. As in a dream, a voice told the sleeper that his time had come, that so many more chemos would pass before he would have to bid his world goodbye. Then in the sacrament of Schlerik Itata, his body and soul were rendered astral, and in a cloud of smoke the favored one disappeared from sight and entered into dwelling with his god. It was a wonderful end. There would be no great sadness at such a departure. No corruption was to be the lot of the departing Jovian. He was just carried into glory. But those poor souls that suffered Sirkwar remained in their comatose condition. Alive, yet dead. Dead, yet alive. Useless to themselves and of no use to no one. No wonder it was the one dreaded thing in this land of all good. 
There were but fifty bodies in the condition of Sirkwar in the whole of Kimar, and most of them had been there for many ages. None could remember some of them as creatures full of life. Their names were written on tablets and placed above them, their only connection with the generation of the present. In a small underground chapel in the temple of Humori were these poor ones kept. Niches, cushion-lined, were made in the walls, and in these the victims were laid. There they would remain until Jupiter itself returned to its first void and emptied its population into the lap of heaven. "'I beg you stay not long here, my lord,' said the Waz to Alan. "'Tis an evil place, and I would fain hurry and leave it far behind me.' "'Nay, my Waz, stay until the chemo rises full in the heavens. "'Tis but a short time now, and then I shall be ready to accompany you. "'There were no separate degrees of punishment in the Hall of Sorrows. "'The real punishment lay in its awful loneliness.' The Kimarnians who were there were paying dearly for their faults. Utter loneliness, comfortless, cheerless, it was desolation personified. Those were the first impressions that Alan received. Food was let down from the air at certain intervals. There was no division, and only just sufficient to go round. It was a question of first come, first served, and the man who appeared last received little, if any, of his portion. No lighting was arranged in the place, and as it was near the pole, half their time was spent in total blackness. There was no warmth, it was cold and draughty, no privacy, no comfort. The Camarnians who offended purged themselves clean in this dread place of sorrow. Once they were free of it, they never put themselves into the position to be sent there again. Their terms of incarceration varied. For some it might be for only six chemos, for others sixty or even six hundred. The worst sinner there had nothing on his conscience one quarter as bad as Eric the Miserable, but he was sent there, too, to consort with them. Alan could not bear to stay in the place. The atmosphere stifled him. The sight depressed him. His last view of Eric was a lonely figure in a gown of black, sitting drearily in a corner of the big hall, watching intently the still form of his late master. His hands were clasped, his expression hopeless, his whole attitude one of despair. "'It's very terrible,' said Alan to the Waz as they sailed away from Fujipo. "'What is, my lord?' "'Your hall of sorrows.' "'But why, my lord?' "'Surely it must do more harm than good,' the Waz looked amazed. "'I know if I were sent to such a place, I would come out hardened and defiant.' The Jovian smiled. "'That is where we differ, my Alan.' The Kimarnian hates evil of every kind. This dread is born in him. He offends ever so slightly. The priest remonstrates with him. He makes promises to atone, but offends again. No second chance is given him. Straight to the Hall of Sorrows he is sent, there to live in discomfort, cold and solitude. He is too ashamed to mix with his fellow creatures, so his sin is purged and he comes out a better man. Alan laughed silently at the Kimarnian's earnestness. I am afraid, my friend, that the world I came from was more material than yours. A life in such a place would have led to worse sin. It would not have cured it. Then I am glad I belong to Kimar, said the Waz simply. They made the return journey in record time, and Desmond and Mavis were waiting for Alan on the roof station when the airbird sailed in. Welcome home, said Mavis. We have missed you badly. However, everything is ready for you, and in three more chemos we will have you safely married. Are you so anxious to get rid of me? laughed Alan. No, answered Mavis with a happy smile. But I've tasted the joys myself, and I want you to find your happiness also, my brother. That's very nicely put, Mavis, said Alan tenderly. I could wish for no one but you for Desmond. At first I was a little jealous when I thought his affection for me would be halved. Not halved, Alan. No, that's not the right word. But Desmond and I had been everything to each other from our childhood, and then you came. Well? Now I understand what it means, and am glad I am going to partake of the same kind of happiness that Desmond enjoys. I'm sure you'll be happy, Alan. Flory is so sweet, so human, so understanding. But there came a perplexed note into her voice. I'm afraid of only one thing, Alan. You are sure you are not too... too material for these Jovians? You are going to mate with a girl almost... 
spiritual, if I may so put it. Now, the time is drawing near. I am so afraid. Don't be afraid, little woman. I've learned a great deal since I came here. The past is growing dim. My love for Clory is so great that I think it is canceling all my earthly senses. I have only one fear for the future. And that is? My inborn dread of death. Not that I fear death for myself, but dread its coming and separating me from my love. She will not have that fear. Until I can comfort myself in the belief of Shlarika Tata, I shall have that fear always with me. Death. Mavis looked dreamily into the distance where her son and his father were romping together. I think I, too, have a tiny bit of fear left, said she. But I am trying to put it away. We have left the old world behind us. I was wrong to put doubts in your heart, Alan. You've chosen wisely, I am sure. Good luck and good fortune be yours. End of section 32Section 33 of The Perfect World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mrs. L. Sid. The Perfect World by Alice Grimsour, Section 33. The Triumph of Ack Allen. The populace of Hermory were wildly excited, for the time had come when their princess, the Ipsororca of all Kimar, was to wed. Every place was full, the streets were thronged with visitors, for people had come from all parts of Jupiter to witness the long ceremonies and jubilations that preceded the actual wedding. Parties came from the warmth of Zor, from the heat of Pela, from the temperate breezes of the Isles of Kelo. Every dwelling house in Hermori was full, every public guest house had used every available space for their overflowing guests. The streets were gaily decorated, the trees were adorned with colored lights, and across the wide boulevards silken flags were hung. There were festoons of flowers and leaves everywhere. Every window was bright with silken rugs. The whole scene was gay and brilliant. The first ceremony of interest was the admittance of Alan into the bosom of the Rorcas family. In a wonderful golden robe, Alan stood at the foot of the Rorcas throne in the great white throne room in the palace. The whole apartment was thronged with guests, and by the Rorcas side sat the princess, she had on her face a grave, sweet smile, and in her court robes of blue and gold she made a regal figure. A majordomo handed the Rorca a golden fillet of beautiful workmanship studded with diamonds. This was placed on Alan's head by the Rorca himself, who said, O oh, Alan, known henceforward by the royal prefix of Ak, I salute thee. Thou hast taken the oaths of allegiance to me, your Rorca. Thy fidelity and love thou hast offered me, I salute thee, O Ak Allen. And he took him by both hands and kissed him on either cheek and raised him to the topmost step of the throne. Then Allen faced the people. Behold him, said the Rorca. Ak Allen, a noble of the house of Pluholz, acclaim him as your own, for he is indeed a prince of the house of your Rorca. How the people cheered! With one accord they shouted and surged forward to the foot of the throne and stretched out their hands to the newly made prince. Alan was delighted with his reception and had an individual word to say to nearly everyone who came near him. The story of his adventure for Clory had been widely told. Colmervan's treachery was known, and everyone welcomed the newcomer royally. But this was only the beginning. Ak Alan had to become a Joe of the Outer Shelter and to receive the blue ribbon of his office. The golden circle of unity of Kimar was placed on his finger, the Star of Joy, the Order of Hope. All these ceremonies took their time, but they were all picturesque and interesting. Many times had he looked upon Clory, but never had an opportunity been given to him to speak with her alone. But at his ardent gaze, the shy color would mount her cheeks, and her eyes would drop in sweet embarrassment. Wazikeshta had been appointed to the royal household of Ak Allen, and was delighted to have the opportunity to remain by the side of the friend he had made. Persaf, the Jakak, and Mirasu, the Jackalata, had sent handsome presents to Alan and Clory, and had expressed their sorrow when Desmond had announced his intention of settling down in her mori. We want to be near Alan, explained Sir John. We shall miss you, of course. We are grateful for your kindness to us all, since we arrived so strangely in your land. 
but we should miss the society of our kinsmen. We must stay near him. We understand, said Persoff, but visit us, my friends, and allow us to visit you. Your friendship is dear to us. Your esteem we prize. Several orders had been offered Sir John, but he stuck to his prefix throughout. My father earned it, he explained. I honor him by using it. Please allow me to keep it. And the Roca gave his permission. During all this time, Masters had scarcely left Sir John's side. A devoted friend, a loyal servant, he remained always at hand in case the old man needed him, and when Allen had been appointed Ack of the House of Pluholz, Masters received the shock of his life. Suddenly the major-domo cried out, And I command Masters of the household of Sir John to kneel at the foot of the Rorca's throne. Masters turned dead white and looked appealingly at Sir John. Go forward, my friend, said Sir John, and Masters obeyed him. The Rorca rose and touched him lightly with the silver staff of office of a waz. I promote thee henceforward, waz, to the house of Sir John. Waz Masters shall thou be with all that pertains thereto. Except this staff, Waz Masters, for thou art a faithful friend. Masters was unable to express his gratitude. The honor was so unexpected that it rendered him speechless. But a few moments later, Alan smiled as he saw him talking earnestly with Zilia, a woman of Yekeshtas. And as Alan watched the luminous eyes that smiled at Masters, watched the parted lips and the color that came and went in the olive-tinted cheeks of the beautiful Kimarnian, he foresaw, and foresaw truly, that Masters would soon forsake the lonely role of bachelor, and another love match would be made in Kimar, the land of all good. Then came the feasts and banquets, a pageant and procession through the streets of Humori. Bjors gaily decorated, fancifully costumed bands, dancing children dressed like wood nymphs, fair-headed, slim youths with pipes like the pipes of Pan, woodland fairies, ladies in court attire, all took part in this wonderful procession. And Alan sat on a balcony in the royal palace and watched it, but half the time his eyes were feasting on the features of his bride of the morrow. Occasionally, under the cover of the cheers in the darkness, his hand would stray out, and for a moment clasp hers in the darkness. But no chance had he of speaking with her alone, and her nearness maddened him with passionate longings. He longed to be alone with her, away in the woods and fields, along the seashore, just they two together, communing with nature in all her glory. "'May I not speak to Clory a moment alone?' he begged earnestly. The Rorca smiled. "'In your world, perhaps, it would be allowed, but I cannot sanction it. "'Today she belongs to me, to the people. "'Tomorrow she will be yours forever. "'It is custom, my son. "'But tomorrow,' he stopped and looked shrewdly at Alan, "'I have been converted to your honeymoon. "'It is a strange idea to us of Kimar, but a beautiful one, "'and will, I think, prove popular with my countrymen.' Tomorrow you take her away, alone. No duenna's guiding eye will follow you. The house of roses in the Waiyo forest is at your disposal. It is ready, prepared. I have given way on many points, my son, but on this one I am firm. You cannot speak alone to Corrie tonight. Now, I wish to speak to Sir John. Alan bowed his head and moved away, so that his uncle could take his place. He was further away from his love, but sat in the shadow and gloried in her as the light shone brightly on her profile. "'Sir John,' said the Rorca, "'I have heard much about your wonderful airship that carried you safely to our world. Would you be prepared to build another as like it as possible? I will place men, material, and means at your disposal. You need want for nothing, and I should esteem it a personal favor if you would at least consider my proposal.' Sir John's eyes shone. "'Oh, Rorca!' You have put new life into me by your suggestion. I felt I was growing old, but my heart is still young. To be of use in your world will make my last years happy. To feel I am not wasting my time will strengthen my life. Masters and I were planning another Argenta on paper only today. He has been examining the metal you use, and he says it is even lighter and stronger than our aluminum. My whole time is at your disposal, and Masters is as well. Speak for yourself, Sir John, smiled the Rorca. But unless I am much mistaken, Zilia will have more to say about Waz Master's affairs than you have dreamt of. Zilia, repeated Sir John, looking puzzled. Look behind you, said the Rorca. In the room behind were two figures, Masters and a woman. The woman was delicately beautiful, darker than most Kimarnian women, with blue-black hair and flashing eyes. 
So he has found a mate, said Sir John softly. I never thought of masters in marriage. He seemed too mature. In our world, he would have been called middle-aged. He has seen forty and three summers. But Zillia is mature, said the Rorca. She looks a girl, but although her soul is young, she and masters are not far apart in years. You will not object to the match? Nay, I have a great opinion of Waz Masters, but I like not his name. He touched a bell. Waz Masters and the Lady Zillia. I desire them here at once. The girl bowed, and in a moment the two were standing before him. My friend, said the Rorca kindly, I like not your name. Waz Masters sounds crude and harsh. In our language we have a far softer word that means master. Henceforward shall you be known by that. Waz Emo, for now and ever. Masters remained silent. He was embarrassed and hardly knew what to do. So you are going to mate with Zillia? said the Rorca. Zillia bent on one knee, her hands extended in supplication. O oh, Rorca, most noble, have I thy permission? Him have I promised to wed, if I have thy permission, for I love this stranger dearly. My consent was given long ago. I have watched your play with pleasure, my child. Tell Wajikesta he can give you the use of an airbird for your, your honeymoon. Oh, how can I thank you? That is enough. See, the procession has resumed. How beautiful are the flowers, the silks. And taking these words as their dismissal, they bent on one knee and then passed from the balcony to the room beyond. The last vehicle had passed. The last burst of music had died away. Night fell. But one more ceremony remained to conclude the time of rejoicing, the wedding on the morrow. Alan woke early on the morning of his wedding day. His personal attendant had placed all his wedding clothes ready for him and he donned the golden robe and swung from his shoulders the blue velvet cloak. It was lined with gold and caught up at one corner with a beautiful jeweled buckle. His fillet of gold was on his head, and as he looked at himself in the long glass, he saw the romantic robes fade away, leaving in their place a worn and shabby, but nevertheless very comfortable golf jacket. The shadowy figure was carrying a bag over his shoulder. Golf clubs. Alan sighed. It was a very long time since he had teed up, and with a mighty drive seen a little white ball sent skimming along at a terrific pace. He could see the ascent to the approach of his favorite green, the green itself smooth and velvety, resting in a little hollow below. Well, he would get his game of golf on Jupiter. He would plan a course, have clubs made, and he and Clory would... No, he didn't regret giving up the old and ugly garments of the earth. He regretted nothing. He wouldn't have altered his fate if it had been in his power to do so. Life held nothing for him but glory. Life and love were before him, and he felt fitted for and happy in the new world. His golden, sandal-like boots were on. The ring for glory was in his satchel purse. The crown of wifehood, with which he would presently crown her, was in Waikeshta's possession. The Waz also had taken care of the gifts, which according to the rites of the temple he must present to his wife the coins, to represent that he endowed her with his wealth, the loaf divided in two, to denote that she would share in everything, the fresh-cut flowers, a symbol of the joys they would find in each other, and lastly the basket of fruits that were to be laid on the altar and offered as a burnt offering to Mitzer the Mighty. As they were reduced to ashes, the high priest would waft them to the four winds of heaven, and the nuptial pair would swear to love each other until such time arrived as the burnt fruits regained their virgin freshness. A poetical way of vowing their eternity fidelity to each other. Wazikeshta entered. He was plainly nervous at the thought of the part he was to play in the day's ceremony. The time has come, my Alan. Your bajor awaits you. I am ready, Alan smiled at the waz. I don't know how I should get on without you today. The streets were thronged with people. Alan sat alone in the state bjor, which drove slowly down the decorated streets, and immediately in front of the bridegroom's equipage rode Waikeshta on a magnificent white collie. Sixteen Kimarnians, appointed by the Rorca for his personal staff, rode behind him. Sir John and Desmond were already in the temple. A beautiful blue carpet spread from the door to the street, and the whole way was lined with flowers. Slowly, Alan walked up the flowered aisle and took his place at the altar rails. The organ was playing softly. Suddenly, it burst out into the Ipsor Rorca's personal air. 
The bride had arrived. On the arm of the Rorca, she walked up the long aisle. Her bridal gown of blue brought out the color of her eyes. Upon her hair was draped a thin veil of gold, and her long train was carried by little sturdy John Allen. At the altar rails they stopped, and the high priest demanded, Who giveth permission that this woman shall leave her home and her people, and live in peace with the mate of her choice? I do, said the Rorca. You are convinced that happiness and joy will be the woman's lot? I am. Thanks be to Mitzer, I am content. Thereupon the Rorca took his seat upon his throne, and the ceremony commenced. Mavis, who had followed the bridal procession, now took her place on Clory's left to assist the bride. It was a beautiful ceremony, and the incense, the priest vestments, the music, all helped to make it awe-inspiring and impressive. The gifts were offered. Clory accepted them. The moment was almost at hand that would make them one. Alan was repeating softly after the priest. May this ring, with which I encircle thy finger, be a lasting proof of the unity of our affection. May the circlet with which I crown thee prove that I honor thee as my loved one, and install thee as queen of my house. And Clory answered softly, I accept this ring, and from my finger it shall never slip. I accept the crown that thou offerest me, and in return I pray Mitzer the Mighty that I may rule my household wisely and well. Then came the vows of love and fidelity. Each repeated the words with hands clasped. Before Mitzer the Mighty, the great white glory, I promise to let not come between my chosen spouse and me. I promise to love him, her, and honor him, her, share his, her, troubles, and smooth away his, her, griefs. Lastly, I ask Mitzer, the tower of strength, to crown us both with the glory of our union. Then, kneeling, the high priest blessed them. May Mitzer, the great white glory, bless you both, and keep you both in the paths of righteousness. May he make thee, O Ak Allen, a tender husband, and thee, Clory, a loving wife. Thy vows are made. Kneel and pray while the sacrificial fires are lighted, and the dust of thy offering is thrown to the winds. Hand in hand the newly married pair knelt. Into a tiny tabernacle the offering of fruits was placed. The doors closed upon it. A second passed, and by the aid of etheric heat there was nothing left but a little powdery dust. Slowly the priests and acolytes walked down the aisle, the bridal pair following. With prayers and exhortations the dust was scattered and wafted out of sight by the breeze. The ceremony was over. A hymn of joy was sung and Alan and Clory were led to their bjor that was waiting. They drove together in the open bjor, and Clory could not speak. Her heart was too full of emotion. The excitement, the cheering, the crowds tired her, and yet there was still a reception to get through. Not a word had she spoken to her newly made husband, but as they alighted, he whispered, You don't regret, my darling? She gave him a quick, shy glance, but it satisfied him. They had to wait for the congratulations of the intimate friends and guests, but at last Mavis whispered, Come, dear, it is time for you to change into your other frock. Quietly the bride left the reception and changed into her other gown. Tenderly she bade her father goodbye. Goodbye, my little one, he murmured. Mitzer, take care of you. In forty kaimos I shall come for you. Be happy in your new life. Goodbye, my father. Goodbye. You will find everything in readiness at the House of Roses, said Wazikeshta. There were renewed cheers, the band played, and the comfortable equipage drove off, burying the happiest couple in all Kimar. My darling, murmured Alan when they were at last outside the town and running swiftly through quiet country roads, are you sure you won't regret this day? Never, my Alan, she replied, her eyes smiling as she nestled close to her husband. But Alan... I think I am a little frightened all the same. For answer, he crushed her in his arms and rained passionate kisses on her unresisting lips, and it sufficed her. She was content. End of section 33。Section 34 of The Perfect World。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zoinkmeister Patrick, youtube.com slash Zoinkmeister. The Perfect World by Ella Scrimsour. 
Book 4, The Perfect World, Chapter 16, The Perfect World Many hundreds of times the Kaimo rose and set, and Ak Allen and his wife, beloved of all Kimarians, lived in peace and happiness. A son and daughter had been born to them, and now the time had come when Rorka had received his call, and through the sacrament of Sklarek Itata would make his exit from the world and enter into glory. My son, he said. The voice came in my sleep last night. My room was bathed in a wonderful whiteness when the messenger from Mitsor called me. When the Kaimo reaches the full for thirteen days, make ready, for on the fourteenth thou shalt meet the great white glory. I must now set my house in order. You will reign jointly with glory. I can safely leave my country in your hands. Father, said Alan, must you really leave us? He was troubled. Oh, it's terrible. But why? said Clory. I shall miss my father, it is true, for I love him dearly. But how can I wish him here when his happiness lies yonder? I don't understand, said Alan miserably. Death is so sad. But it is not death, said Rorka. I am simply going away. That's it. You are going away, and you are never coming back. That is true, my son. I am never coming back, but you will eventually come to me. Why mourn? To mourn is selfish. It's no good, said Alan. I suppose I am of coarser clay. I can't believe that I could ever pass yonder through the sacrament of Sclerakitata. I come from another world. Suppose I die. Oh, you don't know death as I do, but suppose it comes to Kimar through me, and afterwards through my children. Have no fear, said the Rorka. That day will never come. And so the last few days had passed, and Alan saw him enveloped in the incense and vanished from sight. Alan marveled at his wife's fortitude. He had felt the knife of death on Terra. This glorious parting was so different. He longed to believe that he too one day would vanish thus, material and earthly though he was. And so Alan, the Rorka, and Clory, his wife, were crowned and occupied joint thrones in the land of Kimar. Their joy in their unity and the completeness of their life was a constant wonder to them. They renewed their joys in their children. Their life was almost perfect. Sir John was growing feeble. Part of the time he spent with Mavis and Desmond and part with Alan. But wherever he went, Masters and Xylia always accompanied him. Mavis's three children, and Alan's two, grew up like brothers and sisters. Indeed, their parents were all like one big family. Alan had not long been on the throne of Kimar when an urgent message was brought him that Waz Mula humbly begged an audience. Who is he? asked Alan. He is holder to the key to the Hall of Sorrows, answered Eek Jesta and sails the air bird that plies to and fro from Fijipo. I remember him well. Bring him in. Oh, noble Rorka, I beg a favor of you, said Mula. What is it that troubles you? You remember Arak the Miserable. Well? He has done a most noble thing, O oh Rorka. A most terrible scourge has come upon the Hall of Sorrows. A fire broke out. How or where it started, no one can tell. But when I reached the place, it was a raging furnace, and the poor captives were beating against the gates in their frenzy to get out. The heat was intense, their skins were blistering. I landed safely and rushed to undo the gates. But even as I did so, great tongues of fire curled out and licked round me. See, O oh Rorka, my hands are burnt, my hair is scorched. Three times I essayed to unlock the padlock, but the flames drove me back. Suddenly I heard a cry, and the rack burst through the flames. Throw me the keys, he cried, and his tone commanded, and I obeyed. I watched him as he touched the red-hot metal. The flames were fiercer than before. He never trembled or grew hasty. All those clothes were in flames, and the flesh burnt from his fingers. Yet still he strove to open the prison door. At length he succeeded. Five figures fell out on the ground, burnt, and still. I called to Arak to save himself, 
but his only answer was to beat his way through the avenue of fire. Minutes passed and he did not return. We looked at the poor, burnt things at our feet. Their souls had departed. But as we looked, their mutilated bodies disappeared. Then, through the smoke and grime, Arak appeared, bringing in his arms a burden which he laid at my feet. He returned again and again, and yet again. Five women's lives he saved, and he returned again to save the life of a pet animal. Then, oh, Rorka, he fell at my feet. His face was burnt beyond recognition, his poor hands useless, his body one mass of blisters. He and those he saved were brought to Hurmuri. The women are now in safety, but the rack says his call has come. Oh, my Rorka, this then is my prayer. His one wish now is to enter into glory to the sacrament of Sklareki Tata. Will you grant him pardon and answer his prayer? Alan was much moved. Go, return to Iraq. Tell him Miss Roth shall come and administer the sacrament himself. May I say that? Yes, where is he now? On board the airbird. He's in great pain, but I think I could get him taken to the temple in safety. See to it at once, my was. Hurriedly, Alan sent for Misrath and told him the news. He has purged his sins indeed, said he. So, with the rites of Sklareki Tata, Arak left Kimar. He bent and kissed the hem of Alan's garment and sank back exhausted in his chair. And as the incense covered him, his voice could be heard murmuring, Great white glory, I come, I come. And so there is to be no more Hall of Sorrows, said Chloe softly. No, my darling, it's gone forever. Yes, it has served its purpose, but I don't think its omission will bring more sin into Kimar. I believe you are right, Alan. It was a terrible place, and sometimes I think the punishment was too great for the sin. A blue-eyed, curly-haired girl ran into the room, breathless and flushed. She clasped a doll in her arms and hugged a pink-cheeked apple. She was followed by a bright, eager-faced boy of twelve or thereabouts. No, John Allen, I won't marry you, she said. I am a Kuchi, and Ipso Rorka, and you are only Ak. The children did not see the grown-ups who were hidden by a curtain, and their childish chatter went on unheeded. You must marry me, Akuchi. I love you, and Papa says that love is everything. The little maid pouted. I love you, John Allen, and I think I'll marry you after all. The two children embraced fondly and ran out of the room hand in hand. My wife, said Allen, don't ever leave me. Teach me to know the real meaning of Skrileki Tata. Teach me to believe. Chlori offered her beautiful lips to her husband. Love teaches everything, my husband. Love is powerful. Love is mighty. Love will teach you even that. He strained her to his breast. My wife, my wife, I love you so. The terror of parting is always with me. Teach me to believe. You see, dear, even in this perfect world, there is a grain of sadness, of earthly discontent. My husband, I have no fear. Listen. And from outside came the merry, laughing voices of their children at play. In your children, you will learn belief. Envoy. The time came when Sir John himself heard the call. Half believing, half fearing, he bade farewell. The prayers were said, the incense rose about him, and he, like the Jovians themselves, was taken to the great white glory and was seen no more. And in that moment, Alan believed and was content. My wife, he cried, no longer is there any sadness in my life. I believe. Jovians we have become in body and in soul. I no longer fear death. And hand in hand they sat, married lovers ever, and watched their children at play. The End End of Chapter 16, The Perfect World Recording by Zoinkmeister Patrick YouTube.com slash Zoinkmeister End of The Perfect World by Ella Scrimsauer